Ms. Williams, can you let me know when we're able to start? It's six o'clock now, but I'm not sure if all of our systems are up and uh, linked and streaming appropriately. Systems are all up and linked. We're good to go. Thank you. And you've been made co-host. Okay, great. And uh, so welcome everybody. We are uh, here for our special Committee of the Whole uh, meeting uh, where we're doing our financial planning. Uh, tied to our strategic planning. Uh, as I call it to order, we just want to acknowledge that we're gathered here on the uh, traditional territories of the Coast and Strait Salish people, specifically the Lekwungen speaking people known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, that their connections to these lands continues to this day. Uh, up first, we have adoption of the agenda. We just need a motion to adopt the agenda to include, amended to include public participation as our, by default, that is not uh, part of this process. Uh, as I saw moved by Councillor Braithwaite, uh, seconded by Councillor Patterson. Thank you very much. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favour? Any opposed? None opposed? That passes. Thank you very much. Um, Mayor's remarks, uh, very brief. I just uh, wanted to let all those watching, this is, a, uh, this is the first of our budget uh, or financial planning meetings. Uh, you'll be seeing a number of presentations, uh, both from uh, outside agencies to which we provide funding, um, but also our internal uh, departmental and, and overall financial planning uh, updates. So uh, with that, we have a, uh, uh, a fair bit of work to get through here. We're gonna try and get through as much of it as we can. Uh, we have some items at the end that we'll get to if we have time, um, but we also wanna provide time for both uh, in-depth questions from council as well as uh, opportunities for the public to speak as well. Uh, I will call on the public periodically as we go through this meeting. Um, specifically, I'll call people after item 5.1, the draft financial plan overview. And then I'll call uh, again as we go through and uh, our director of corporate services <clears throat> can provide us guidance on, uh, on how you'll be able to get on. So with that, um, we're just gonna move into the budget, uh, <clears throat> to the budget principles and timelines. And I'm essentially handing these portions over to staff to provide some uh, updates. Um, Mr. Payne, am I handing this, this portion to you? Uh, yes, Your Worship, I'm ready to go if you're ready to go. Please go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna just start by uh, putting on the PowerPoint presentation. We'll see if that uh, comes up here. Hmm. That might not be the right one. Just one quick second here. Yep, actually that one should be it. Okay, and just let me let me know if you can see the PowerPoint presentation there. We can see the PowerPoint, yes. Dated Excellent. February 4th, yes, thank you. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so just go over quickly what the full uh, night's agenda looks like. First, we're gonna just start with uh, our budget principles and talk about how the budget is put together, the process and the timeline. Um, I'll have a quick presentation here about um, the financial plan overview, the big picture, and, and that will allow council and the public to uh, consider the decisions in the budget process in the context of the, the whole financial picture. We talk uh, a bit about our asset management and our reserves, as that's an important piece of the, uh, of the big picture. Uh, the library is here today to um, uh, provide a presentation that's a tradition of mine to start the uh, budget presentations with the library, because as I mentioned, everyone, everyone loves a library. So it's a great, great way to start a, a positive way to start the uh, financial plan deliberations. And South Island Prosperity Partnership is also here with us today. And then we'll just talk a bit about the, uh, the special initiatives in the budget. Uh, we did talk a lot about this recently in the January 28th special meeting uh, of uh, council um, that related to strategic priorities. Um, but there's a number of um, uh, funding uh, decisions to be made there. And then uh, to end the night, we're gonna go through a number of operating budgets, um, approximately half of them or so, um, as well as one capital budget in, in, uh, in the police department. So just gonna begin today to, to mention and, and um, um, note that the district was the recipient of the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award uh, last year from the GFOA of US and Canada. And it's just to, to acknowledge this council's uh, hard work in um, uh, setting a high standard for uh, budget uh, transparency and accountability, and also the hard work put into it uh, by the various partners of the finance department, including uh, Haley, Haley in our communications department and, and the other supporting departments to achieve that. This year's uh, financial plan has been um, prepared to the same standard and 
uh, hoping to even exceed that standard. So the budget principles we, we talk about that do appear in the financial plan, first of all, the budget is prepared uh, in the service level approach. So it's assumed in the financial plan that council wants to maintain existing service levels, except in Mr. the case Payne, where council, pardon Mr. me? Mr. Payne, sorry, more sorry to interrupt. I just had someone's hand go up briefly. Uh, was uh, the one labeled Oak Bay Meetings. I'm not sure who that is. Uh, did someone wish to, was it one of the councillors wishing to speak? My apologies, Mayor Murdoch. It's Selena here, your Director of Corporate Services. I was clapping for the award. Oh, <laughs> okay. It just popped up as a hand on your on the screen, so I wanted to make sure I if I had to raise an issue of uh, a point of privilege or something, I could get to that, but uh, that's much simpler. We'll move back to Mr. Payne. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Your Worship. So, so to recap, the, uh, the budget is prepared with a service level approach, which means it's uh, prepared with the assumption that council wants to maintain existing service levels, except in the case where council is directed that service levels be adjusted or regulation requires that we uh, adjust service level. That's the assumption and the basis for the operating department budgets. Uh, we, we take careful note to uh, align the funding sources for the, for the expenses that are ongoing. Uh, we'd like to fund with ongoing revenue such as property taxation and user fees. And for the expenses that are one time or are, are in ordinary, we fund with surplus, which is uh, not a sustainable uh, funding source. Uh, we've integrated the, the principles of project budget carryover. So there's a number of projects that were underway, underway in 2020. And if they were not complete the funding, the remaining funding has already been carried forward into the 2021 budget, which is very similar to the next principle that the financial plan is, is a five-year financial plan and council is providing authorization uh, for uh, uh, funding for those five years. Uh, every year council uh, comes together to amend that financial plan and a new financial plan is, uh, is prepared. Uh, but uh, business carries on as usual unless, unless uh, uh, staff is informed otherwise. Uh, there, therefore, I'd like to highlight uh, during the meetings that uh, when you're considering the five-year financial plan, uh, in particular, it's, it's important to consider 2021 and 2022. Uh, because January 1st, 2022 can come along and staff will continue with the work that's authorized in the five-year financial plan this year. Um, so we've done that this year. There's a number of projects that were authorized to begin in 2021, and many of those projects are already underway, even before these budget considerations. So that keeps, that keeps the, the uh, municipality moving forward, and we can uh, continue uh, fast pace. Uh, life cycle costing is integrated into the financial plan. You'll see there's a number of capital budgets this year that's really uh, represent an incremental impact in the long term of the financial plan. So I always use the example of the Carnarvon uh, Park building, which is uh, slated for um, funding in 2025. It's a $5 million capital budget request. Uh, but really the, the question that is being posed to council, it's more than a $5 million request. It's, it's a $23 million uh, request when you consider the life cycle costs of that building, the maintenance and, and, uh, and the uh, reserve contributions that will be required. So we integrate that into all capital budgets that represent an incremental increase to the capital that we have. The financial plan itself is not a legislated or mandated document. It provides additional transparency to our users and to the uh, public and, and to council in order to be decision useful. The mandated document is the financial plan bylaw, which is a very um, summarized version of the financial plan document. It doesn't really provide any uh, detail on what the money will be spent on, as it's just a, a spending authorization bylaw. But this, this uh, um, financial plan document uh, uh, supports transparency. So in terms of how things appear in the financial plan, plan. Uh, the first step is council will approve service level. So again, there is an assumption in there that if uh, council is pleased with service levels as they exist, we're going to retain that moving into the financial plan. And then uh, staff ensure that they integrate funding for council directed in initiatives and adjustments to service level. And lastly, staff need to uh, interpret action that's needed uh, for uh, council endorsed plans and visions. So uh, uh, supposing you have an, act, an active transportation plan uh, and council endorses that plan, the financial impact of that plan is integrated into the 
uh, financial plan and, uh, and, and brought before council for consideration in the financial plan. And as mentioned, staff don't unilaterally increase or decrease service levels uh, unless council directs it or those are legislated or regulated outside of council direction. As the uh, mayor mentioned, public input is welcome at every stage. A budget questionnaire has already been uh, populated and, uh, and integrated into the um, considerations in the financial plan. And, and there'll be num numerous opportunities during the budget presentations today and for the next, uh, next two meetings, as well as council thereafter. We'd like to start with the entire financial plan. This is a little bit of a, a switch for uh, Oak Bay. Um, we've, previously, the financial plan was sort of built brick by brick, and then um, you know, finance would show what the final product was. Instead, we're starting at what could be a finished product, and then uh, council has an opportunity to refine that product. And it just helps uh, council and the public, again, to be able to judge and make decisions based in the big, in the big picture. Uh, so they can have they, they can contextualize decisions that way. Uh, in, during the financial plan uh, building process, let's call it, uh, staff will take council direction. Again, uh, it, it's always more than welcome to hear uh, individual perspectives from council. Uh, uh, but on uh, on uh, items of material uh, materiality and, and material change to the financial plan, staff really need to hear from council in the form of a resolution. And so um, should. Uh, uh, a councillor uh, want to make a, a substantive change to the financial plan as presented. Uh, staff would recommend uh, putting that in the form of resolution and uh, and, uh, and let council uh, make that decision. We're going to try to keep uh, the version control um, as best as possible. This year, I think uh, we've gotten into a groove uh, a lot better than, than last year. Um, we had a, a bit more time to prepare this year. Uh, but I, I do appreciate um, um, uh, uh, feedback on the financial plan, the presentation, typos, grammar, anything like that. This is version one. We've labeled it as version one. Uh, we'll have version two ready for February 18th. And we'll just make, I just uh, I would uh, recommend that council uh, keep an eye on that version at the bottom of the financial plan in case anything substantive changes between versions. We will, we will note uh, major changes between versions at the top of every meeting. So the timeline here, we're gonna talk about uh, about half of the operating budget, maybe a little bit more, um, and then uh, the, the remaining half of the operating budget in February 11th. I'm, I'm trying to, something a little bit new this year, depends on, on uh, whether council likes it or not. I do find that the, the third meeting, uh, which is slated for February 18th, is quite long because it's the capital budget and we discussed that in, in quite detail. So what I would like to do is, if, uh, uh, if possible, depending on how today goes, uh, maybe we could begin the capital budget on February 11th as well, and it wouldn't make the February 18th bud uh, budget meeting so onerous, but we'll see how it goes and, and uh, uh, play it by ear and take direction from council. And then we wrap up the budget, but it's, a, it's usually a very small meeting um, because it just um, summarizes and encapsulates all, all of council direction from the previous three meetings. And we wrap it up at the uh, first actual council meeting in March. The actual financial plan bylaw will not become before council until the earliest in April, uh, but the March meeting usually is usually where uh, final uh, direction is provided to staff. Mind you, last year was a little bit of a, uh, uh, it was certainly a, um, an exception to that rule. Uh, we made some adjustments uh, due to COVID-19 uh, subsequent to that. So there still is an opportunity if, if uh, need be. So as mentioned previously, uh, I, I just repeat again here, decision-making occurs at every stage of the, of the budget presentation. So, you know, if you're, if you're waiting as a member of council to uh, propose changes to the financial plan, um, as far as I'm concerned, no, no better time than the present. Feel free to uh, suggest those changes at any point and test uh, uh, the council table for such changes. And then we will amend the draft financial plan according to committee resolutions and, br and bring that forward in uh, future versions. So we'll start now with a financial plan overview, unless um, there's any questions about that. I, I went through that quite quickly. See any? I don't. Uh, I don't see any. Uh, let's get to the five to the uh, financial plan overview, and we'll take questions at that time. Sounds great. 
So the five-year operating expenditure is forecasted to be $220 million over the next uh, five years, 2021 to 2025. And the five-year capital expenditure forecast is 84 million. So that's a significant increase in capital expenditures proposed uh, since the last five-year financial plan. I believe the last five-year financial plan uh, was close to $69 million. So we'll talk about there's some significant additions to the capital plan, uh, most that come out of the water master plan. And we'll have a chance to talk about that February 11th or February 18th. But something to note for sure. $16.8 million of that capital expenditure is dependent on, uh, on grants. The, the major one, of course, being the upland sewer separation. Uh, $5 million of borrowing is suggested out of that $84 million. That's Carnarvon Park. And then the remainder is reserves. And, and we will talk about uh, financing options later on, uh, uh, closer to the capital budget timeframe. There, there are other options for council. You can have a, a, a mix of, of debt versus um, reserves, um, but hopefully we'll have time for a good robust conversation about that. And the small portion of the capital budget is funded by fees and charges and developer contributions. So we just wanted to talk about some of the risks to the financial plan. I'd like to um, remind council that the financial plan itself is not a projection of what actual spending might be. It's the maximum authorized spending that can occur. So, you, you know, in your experience, you probably know uh, council will authorize a certain number for capital expenditures. And it's, it's not often that the entire capital expenditures is spent. Mind you, I, I do have a great deal of confidence that it will be a significant capital expenditure occur uh, this year, uh, probably another record breaking year as was last year. Um, however, um, the financial plan acts as a limit to what uh, staff can spend to uh, execute council's directives. So COVID-19 is one of the major uh, risks to our financial plan. Uh, in 2020, we saw a, a, a net decrease in PRC net revenues of $1.1 million. So we had, uh, that, that's combining expenditures and revenues. So overall, the net impact is $1.1 million. That's actually uh, a bit better than what was forecasted at quarter three, which was $1.5 million, but nevertheless significant. And so for all of 2021, it's forecasted to be $2.5 million net revenues compared to the original budget in 2020. So that's, uh, that's a significant uh, risk and piece there. And that uh, uh, council provided direction to use the COVID-19 restart grant to, uh, to fund that difference right now. Um, so that would leave some of the grant left over for, to help fund 2020 operations. Uh, however, if the, if the impact of, of COVID extends beyond $2.5 million and, and beyond the remainder in 2022, uh, we'll have to make some decisions there. So that's a risk. For instance, in 20, uh, 2020, the district incurred approximately $450,000 in incremental COVID-19 expenses. Uh, many of those expenses are expected to continue into 2021 uh, and, and have been uh, absorbed into the, uh, into, the, um, uh, the budget, uh, into the respective budgets. Much of that is from the Parks, Rec, and Culture itself. Uh, so that's already included in the forecasted two and a half million dollar uh, drop. Uh, but there are some other uh, impacts such as solid waste department where additional staff is required to ensure proper physical distance, distancing at the uh, public works yard. Um, and so council uh, uh, resolved to maintain a, a reasonable budget there to, to, uh, to pay for that extra physical distancing. We believe that there was some space to reduce the solid waste budget this year had it not been for COVID-19. So hopefully moving into 2022 or 2023, there's some additional uh, space in the budget that, uh, that could be reduced. Uh, investment, investment revenues uh, remain a, a difficult um, uh, challenge to the financial plan. Um, we are uh, forecasting a reduced two and a half million dollars over the next five years. Uh, and that impacts our reserves directly. So our reserve forecasts have suffered as a result of the investment revenues. Um, we see that there's some funds in the municipal, at the Municipal Finance Authority that are actually going negative when you take into account the management fees. And, and that's the market reacting and uh, investing in, in something very safe, which is the Municipal Finance Authority. The district's investment portfolio is diversified. We'll 
you certainly have more than a negative <laughs> investment return. Um, but there is there is risk that that uh, forecast could change. So overall, there is a risk to our reserves. Uh, as mentioned, the investment returns impacts that. We have a number of capital projects that are uh, uh, contingent on capital grants. So that's over $8 million. And if, if those uh, grant applications are not approved, then there's an, uh, potentially another $8 million in, in, in funding that the district has to uh, find and consider. There's a number of asset management plans that are underway. In, in particular, the facilities ma uh, management plan it, uh, starts this year, and it, that may identify more deferred maintenance. So in our, we'll talk about this in our asset management section of this slide later on. But for instance, the um, the, uh, the, uh, the building the building um, sustainable infrastructure funding that we've guessed is going to be around two million dollars per year. Uh, if, if, if the uh, facilities management plan finds that the annual funding we should be set aside exceeds that, or there's a bunch of deferred maintenance, and then our capital plan could be populated significantly and impact our reserves accordingly. And collective bargaining is underway for the fire department and the police department. We don't know where that's going to land. So we've taken some educated guests and uh, integrated in the financial plan, not directly into the operating budgets there, but uh, uh, that could be that could end up different than what we had forecasted. So, looking at the uh, five-year financial plan, uh, staff have put together a spending that would result in uh, a tax increase from 2021 through 2025, as proposed above. So, for 2021, a 6.49% tax increase is proposed. That's that's uh, relatively close to, I believe, what the 2020 financial plan had forecasted. I believe at 6.4%. Although the, co the cost drivers for that have changed and uh, I'll discuss that in, in a bit more detail uh, thereafter. 2022, the forecast is 5.62%. Again, that's in, uh, that's in line with the 2020 financial plan. Uh, pretty similar there. The uh, staff have uh, integrated a, a significant increase to asset management funding again, uh, but that's a, that's a, a consideration that council, council can have. And from 2023 to 2025, uh, staff have uh, integrated higher um, transfers to reserves for our reserve budgets for uh, sustainable infrastructure replacement. And, and this is the, the impact of our investment revenues uh, being lowered, for instance. So we've really had to translate what was gonna be reserve contributions from investment revenues into tax increases there. Um, council can choose to take a slower pace uh, in terms of ramping up our infrastructure funding, um, but this is what uh, uh, staff have put together, which aligns with last year's uh, objectives of uh, achieving uh, a sustainable infrastructure replacement funding by 2024-2025 era. So here's what we have uh, that makes up those tax increases in the respective years. The first component is what we call forced growth. So those are just uh, a cost that uh, naturally increase uh, to maintain existing service levels. Last year, we actually saw uh, a very low inflationary in environment. There were certain months where there was actually deflation as a result of COVID. So most of this 2.65% uh, forced growth actually relates to revenues um, uh, drying up. So the uh, staff actually took a very uh, modest approach to their budgets when it came to training and when it came to uh, materials and supplies, contracted services. Uh, many of the budgets uh, did not increase those, those budget items at all. And those are, those are forced growth items. Uh, but what this really is, is, is salaries and, um, and uh, some of the revenues. So we'll talk about that moving forward. And you can see Moving into 2022 and through to 2025, those forced growth uh, factors, um, they're just projections, but they certainly lower once um, some of that revenue stabilizes, hopefully in the future. The next component of the um, tax increase that's being proposed is for infrastructure. So this year, uh, one, a 1.88% tax increase would be uh, implemented for infrastructure, and that's approximately, I believe, $400,000 more in annual funding, tax-funded infrastructure. Um, Council has already resolved to increase infrastructure spending in the water and sewer utilities. 
So this would be on top of that as well. And as mentioned, you can see in 2022, there is a large 3%, um, more than 3% increase proposed, approximately $800,000 in uh, sustainable infrastructure funding. So th this is discretionary. Um, uh, uh, th this is discretionary until it basically becomes time to repla replace those assets and council, if they wanna maintain existing service levels, uh, you have to incur these costs at some point, um, but increases, uh, tax increases for infrastructure can be um, um, moderated over a longer period, or 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 uh, we could we, we can fill funding with with debt in in the short term. So there's a there's a couple options that we can discuss moving forward. Um, in here, the next component to the tax increase is new staffing. Uh, this year, there was some uh, additional staffing built into the tax increase, the projected tax increase. Uh, much, much has been filled, and, and you'll see where that, that new staffing has been funded in, in each respective department. But for instance, uh, the uh, um, program manager for asset management and facilities, that was a position that was deferred until this year. So that forms part of that component. And then there's modest increases for new staffing built into next year and, and the years thereafter that uh, that is unallocated. And then in 2025, there's a proposed increase just for new debt that would be to fund um, Carnarvon Park. But so this is an, an interesting, interesting point here. Um, the, the Carnarvon Park debt is, is approximately $5 million. And you notice to service that debt over a 30 year period, it's about a 0.82% tax increase. So council could, so I'm just using that example because council could feasibly uh, fund some of the things in the financial plan, not currently identified to be funded by debt, by debt, and the, the relative tax increase would, would be small. Now debt over the long period is more expensive for the, for the rate payers, um, but for the short term, if, if it can be used uh, to um, deliver capital services sooner, and avoid potential cost escalation in the future, it most certainly a viable option. And then there's just other, another little, there's other, other things that, uh, that push us to increase. So in 2023, there's a 0.7, 0.17% increase, and that's actually the operating impact of new capital services, which we'll discuss a bit later. So we just wanted to take a look at asset management at, at a glance and we, we uh, group it by asset class. So you got road, land improvement, sanitary sewer and drainage. And some of the services are listed here, transportation and recreational health, sanitary sewer, uh, sanitary sewer and stormwater conveyance. We have a number of plans that outline how we are to uh, address those assets and manage those assets, transportation and pavement management plan, uh, the recreation, there's a PRC master plan uh, plan for 2024. There's a sewer uh, master plan underway and a storm sewer master plan proposed for 22 and 23. Other assets, including our, our water assets, our vehicle and replacement, our buildings and our natural assets. And there's various plans that are proposed for that. We had a water master plan light that has already been prepared and delivered and a facilities master plan uh, expected in 2021-2022. Uh, so I just wanted to show the public and council the, the real impact that the tax increases dedicated to infrastructure replacement have had on what I would consider a sustainable uh, infrastructure replacement funding. So built-in funding in the tax uh, in the tax revenue as it is. So in 2018, we were at approximately 59%. And then we took a big leap in 2019 to 68%. I believe there's a 3% tax increase dedicated to that. And same with 2020, another 3% tax increase dedicated uh, strictly to uh, funding infrastructure replacement. So, so a 3% tax increase is significant. Um, however, you can see what progress it makes on, on that goal to achieve uh, sustainable service delivery. This year, there would be a slight increase because we've got just over a 1% tax increase or 1.88, I believe it was, dedicated to, uh, to infrastructure funding. And then there's another large increase proposed strictly dedicated to infrastructure for 2022 and so on and so forth. 
Now, the, I just want to give one caveat, caveat about this. You know, staff went through all of our asset classes and estimated as best we could with the information that we have what the annual infrastructure funding should be for that asset class. So again, I'll use buildings as an example. We say right now, according to this plan, it's necessary to set aside $2 million a year so that when we have to replace the rec center or municipal hall or the protective services building, we'll have money sitting in reserves and, and we won't have to incur a really steep tax increase at that time. And so if you think about it that way, we've got $2 million that we think should be set aside annually. Supposing that the useful life of a building on average is, is, is 50, 50, 50 years, that's $100 million in $2,021 that we're saying really should be set aside for buildings. And one can say, no, if we were to replace all our buildings right now, probably over $100 million. I suppose there could be a, an argument for it being less than, than that as well. But that, that sort of gives you the rule of thumb of how those are arrived at. Well, when we prepare the, the, the um, uh, facilities master plan and the other master's plan, they really provide clarity, a bit more clarity, so that our estimates become more uh, certain uh, as to what that level should be. And staff is really aiming to get uh, an infrastructure replacement plan before council, uh, before next budget. So it would be in fall of next year. And that just provides, again, council with a bigger picture. So how long, how long should we continue increasing taxes to fund sustainable infrastructure replacement, how long will it take? Those sort of questions, we should be able to answer on a high level and, and, uh, and that would be good information for the public to know. So this is just another picture by asset class of how sustainable infrastructure funding has improved over the years. And you can see in 2018, uh, most asset class funding, we're at a very dangerous level. You know, We're only setting aside half of what we think we need to, to replace it. And some of those asset classes, mind you, the small ones, the vehicles, for instance, and um, they're completely sustainable by our estimation. And sewer is another one, which we're, we're very close to. So we've seen that we've made uh, significant pro progress from 2022, from 2020 to 2021, it's 82 to 84% or, or around there. So just gonna talk a little bit about our reserves now and I'll remind council reserves is a very broad term. So you, you can have reserves that are established by bylaw. We have a reserve bylaw. Certainly all of those reserves listed there are reserves. You can have reserves established by resolution. So council says, set this money aside. It's kind of, it. we need to use it for a specific purpose. Uh, COVID-19 might be an example of that uh, because council said, set it aside for future um, operational funding at the PRC. That happens to, all, to also be a reserve that is established by external restriction. You could have a reserve that's established by financial plan bylaw. So our infrastructure renewal reserve is an example of that. That infrastructure renewal reserve does not exist in our, uh, in our reserve bylaw. It's really by the will of council um, embodied in the financial plan bylaw that that reserve exists. And then you can have reserves by administrative judgment. So basically that's the, the, that's the finance guy saying, I think we should put this money aside. And again, those reserves, uh, council can use, the council has the authority to use those reserves, notwithstanding uh, my, uh, my recommendation. Then you have accumulated surplus and accumulated surplus is uh, just, just the uh, positive budget results of all years accumulated together. So if we underspent, uh, in the year, it goes to accumulated surplus if it's if it's an oper operational underspending, and that accumulates and it's a, it's a reserve that can be used to fund one time projects. That's a smart way to use that reserves, or council may choose to uh, appropriate part of that and say no, we want to use this reserve on capital, um, and in fact, staff might make that recommendation to council in the coming uh, years. Uh, we might want to appropriate some of our accumulated surplus reserve because it, it uh, exceeds what we think we need operationally. There's reserves required by legislation. Often we um, emulate that legislation by our bylaws. And then there's reserves established by external, external lim limitations. So we have our, a gas tax reserve, for instance, because council and the district has publicly committed to using 
uh, about $6 billion of our gas tax funds to fund the upland sewer separation. So because that's a public commitment by accounting standards, it's, it's externally limited and, uh, and it's reported like that. Um, it's actually reported as what we call deferred revenue in our financial plan, but really what uh, it's, it's reported as, as deferred revenue in our financial statements. But really what I'm answering here is how much money do we have and what can it be spent on? And that's what this, this chart is right here. So at the end of, uh, uh, or at the beginning of 2021, end of 2020, uh, we estimate $56.7 million in reserves. Uh, that is quite a bit more than the financial plan in 2020 had forecasted. Number of reasons for that. The first and, and biggest reason is the COVID-19 uh, grant was given to us at the end of 2020. That was $3.6 million. So we've set that aside uh, in our reserves. There's also a number of reserves that haven't been used that were um, set aside to be used last year. For instance, the fire equipment reserve, we're in the process right now of procuring two fire trucks. Um, and so the fire equipment reserve is expected to be completely used up once those procurements are successful and we have fire trucks. So there's, a reason, there's reasons why some of the reserves aren't as lower as forecasted. And that's, that's mostly around um, capital spending not being uh, uh, fully spent last year. So I just wanted to show council uh, what this financial plan does if approved to our reserves and if we spend to our to our maximum. So we see we start with fifty six point seven million dollars this year, and by twenty twenty five that dips to forty four point two million million dollars. And again, that's if we spend all eighty four million dollars contemplated in the financial plan. But it's important to break this down because uh, that, that's enough to make a, a CFO nervous. And so uh, what I've done is I've broken down the reserve um, trajectory into broad categories. So you've got your, your general surplus and reserves, which is your blue line. And that's just your unappropriated surplus from year after year. And we're seeing a modest improvement in that over, over the five years. Then you've got your capital replacement reserve. So that's the orange line at the top. And that's the one I think that council should spend um, a lot of time paying attention to uh, because that's really our sustainability um, a measure, right? If our capital replacement reserve goes to zero, then we haven't been putting enough aside uh, to anticipate future spending. But you, you can see there's a good trend on that uh, based on growing reserve contributions year over year. So that reserve itself drops by $5 million. But again, if you put that in context of the $84 million in uh, capital spending, uh, that's, that's okay, that's pretty decent. Uh, and then, we, then I uh, uh, distinguish by new capital reserves. So that's reserves that we set aside for absolutely new capital that doesn't exist. It's not replacement of existing capital. And really that's, that's the sewer, that's the upland sewer separation, right? So, so that reserve was always meant to go to zero. We we're always meant to spend it uh, contingent on, on a grant from, from the province. If we get that grant, we want to spend that money. We want to separate the sewers. It was always meant to go to zero. So when you put that in context of the $12.5 million drop, uh, it does change the picture quite a bit. And then, of course, your COVID-19 grant, that's supposed to be spent. So, so if you think about your COVID-19 grant, that's $3 million, and your new capital reserve, that's $7.7 a million dollars, that's $10 million we're supposed to spend if we get the chance to do it. And uh, um, that, that, that makes up a bulk of the, of the drop um, over the years. Now, if I were counsel, I would still be nervous. I, I would wanna know, are we on, on the right path? You know, if we, if we approve the $84 million in capital spending here, uh, is it gonna set the district back a, a long way? Are we gonna recover? Are our reserves gonna recover? And I think a lot of those questions um, will be answered on a high level with the infrastructure replacement plan. And so I'm, I'm going to recommend during the, the financial plan process, the council does approve the financial plan as prepared. Uh, however, uh, upon receipt of the infrastructure replacement plan, we'll know then if those reserves are going to recover and be sustainable in the long term. And if they are, it's good. You know, drawing down and using reserves to pay for capital isn't a bad thing. That's what they were for. Uh, but if the trend is not good, according to the infrastructure replacement plan, maybe we need to backstop with a little bit of debt in the short term. And, and council will have that option moving into the later years of this financial plan. 
So I think there's a lot of decisions to be made upon receipt of that uh, infrastructure replacement plan. Um, and, and I think uh, based on that, um, the financial plan is, is uh, worth approving if it pleases council. So again, I just wanna talk a little bit about debt. Our debt is, is at a very low level. We have uh, what, what's called um, a liability uh, limit um, imposed by a senior levels of government. Um, and we're only able to service a certain portion, we're only allowed to use a portion of our revenues to service debt. And we're well below that limit. In, in 2021, we expect to be at 2.3% of that limit. So, so what we're saying is we could actually incur 50, 50 times the debt that we have on the books right now if we wanted. Uh, that, that's not something I would recommend, but we have a lot of flexibility there, of course. And, and our debt is expected to be completely paid off by the end of 2023 and only to incur new debt for the, for the uh, Carnarvon Park building at, at this point in the financial plan. Okay, so that, that concludes that presentation, Your Worship, and I'm available for questions. Uh, run, to, run to my uh, my microphone. Um, thank you very much for that, Mr. Payne. I uh, really appreciate the overview. Uh, I'm going to go to questions of uh, of council first on this point, and then we'll get to other presentations uh, from the library and the Prosper uh, South Island Prosperity uh, Project. Um, but I will also be inviting members of the public to ask questions on the financial plan overview uh, to ensure that people have access to. Uh, that so before I um, uh, when I when I call on the public, what I will do is uh, we'll turn to Ms. Williams and she will put up uh, the number to call into uh, to access us for that. Is that is that correct, Ms. Williams? That'll come up on the screen. That is correct, Your Worship. Okay, so just stand by for that. Uh, I have a couple of people with raised hands, so I'll go to Councillor Patterson, the Councillor Nay. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you very much for that presentation, Mr. Payne. Congratulations also on this Distinguished Budget Award. Uh, very uh, uh, nice way to be rewarded for the uh, leadership you've shown in creating um, our new five-year plan, uh, five plan budget formats. I would just like to backtrack a bit to um, your statement that, of course, debt is more expensive over the long term um, than funding through reserves. But uh, just if you could also perhaps give us your comments or experience on um, particularly over the last decade, we've had, we've had years of extremely low debt, um, but high rising costs of, um, of construction work and both um, the, the labor and the materials. And so um, in many cases, the rising costs for projects um, may outstrip the, the debt carrying costs. Um, and I think, you know, an example of that is, is that uh, 6 million that was put aside from the um, gas tax revenues for the Uplands sewer separation project? Because um, I think that the, the cost of that project now that has been re-estimated the cost is, is rising at a, a rate that is um, higher than some of the opportunities uh, to take on debt. So if you could just briefly comment on that, please. Uh, thank you, Councillor Patterson. And, and I think maybe also just touch on um, what, uh, what plans are coming forward uh, to help us understand that, uh, that differential to make de decisions uh, going forward as well, Mr. Payne. Uh, yes, uh, thank you through your worship. Um, uh, really an excellent co um, comment because I would uh, agree over the last five to 10 years, the, um, the rate of cost escalation for projects has exceeded what our return on our investment can be. So that's a bit of a mouthful, but supposing we set aside a million dollars this year uh, because, and we wanna save $5 million to replace something five years from now, We'll earn, you know, one per, let's say we earn 1% on that over the next five years. The, it, it may be likely that the, the cost of that project will have risen more than what we have earned in that five years while saving. Um, and that certainly has happened over the five, five, last five to 10 years. So it might, might, may have been prudent if we had a crystal ball to say, um, let's just take on the debt five years, five years ago, get the project done now, avoid the cost escalation, uh, rather than trying to save in advance for it. 
Um, I can't tell you what the future holds in terms of cost escalation for projects, but based on recent history, uh, that's a reasonable conclusion uh, to draw. Um, and so, um, you know, as staff put together um, very robust, robust master plans that are then translated into capital plans, council may just wish to say, let's get on with the work um, and use reserves if we have them. If not, let's, let's take on that debt. And I will just talk a bit more about our, our, uh, our debt process. We're in a very unique situation in, in BC where we borrow through the Municipal Finance Authority and their, uh, um, uh, their credit rating uh, exceeds that of the United States of America. So our ability to borrow through the MFA is extremely cheap. Uh, sub, it's less than inflation because they, they take the principal payments that we make they invested in the stock market and riskier things that we can invest in. And they return that to us as a reduction in our, in our principal that's owed. So we have a very unique opportunity to take on debt that coupled with potential cost escalation, it could be a very prudent course of action to do work now rather than waiting until we have the, all the money in the bank. If I could continue, Mayor. Go ahead, Councilor Patterson. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that explanation, Mr. Payne. Um, I would also like to touch briefly on fair taxation and um, how the um, how debt servicing can perhaps be used to um, to balance that out, uh, particularly for uh, projects that are going to have a long life expectancy, so that the um, the cost of the project, rather than all coming out of reserves and being borne by the uh, residents who pay into those reserves over a shorter period of time are, um, are in fact uh, smoothed out a bit over the years. I'll use that term just for clarity for um, people that might not be familiar with some of the financial terms, but to smooth out some of the, those costs so that they align with the, the use or the benefit of those systems uh, back to the residents at the for the length of time that they um, are residents in the community, perhaps occupy their home in the community, because go, taking the entire hit in the reserves funds can mean um, uh, a very high cost in the shorter term um, and a higher impact for a system that's going to benefit those for many years in the future. Mr. Payne. Uh, yes, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I threw you to Councillor Patterson. I, and a very good point, and it's really a, a, a policy consideration of Council, uh, because the, the fact that um, we don't have sustainable infrastructure funding built into our tax rate as it stands right now, which is, which is the case with most municipalities in BC, speaks to the fact that there has been an inequity in pay for the capital that gets used. Uh, the ideal situation would be once we put in capital, um, the people that are using it are then paying for the replacement at, at the same rate at which they're using it. And that hasn't happened. And so when we're at the end of the life of these assets, now we're incurring large tax increases in a short period of time uh, to get those reserves uh, contributions up to a sustainable level. And so I, I think it would be fair to say that uh, the folks that are paying the taxes today versus 20 years ago um, are, are paying a, a large portion to get that get those levels back up to sustainable level and, and perhaps um, that's that's not fairly smooth over over the life of an asset I, I think that's a, a reasonable conclusion to draw and so you can use debt to solve that uh, to solve that that uh, issue to some degree um, and um, uh, at some point, you're going to have to get that the, the sustainable funding up to um, up to where it needs to be. But debt debt can help smooth that unfairness uh, over the life of the asset. Uh, um, asset. Thank you. And the last um, clarification uh, that I would mayor through you to Mr. Payne is that there are there are many residents that. Um, have a, somewhat of a fear of, of perhaps looking at debt as a way to finance um, major infrastructure projects um, because of the um, 
what they see as, as a liability that, that could place the district at risk. Although certainly through, through COVID, I think we have, have seen the stability um, in the uh, tax revenues to the district. But um, if you could also perhaps comment on the, the, the fact that by not incurring debt and allowing the, um, the infrastructure to be deferred continuously also um, means that we are in fact still um, taking on risk because we have um, a growing liability to fund the, the infrastructure, uh, the additional costs of maintenance uh, and risk of breakdown. And although perhaps at this point in time that is not identified, those risks are just as real as taking on um, debt to, to uh, make an investment into infrastructure. Yeah, Mr. Payne, do you want to just uh, cover off so the, those? I think, uh, Councillor Patterson, you, you kind of covered it in your question, but oh. <laughs> I'll let Mr. Uh, Mr. Payne uh, respond. Uh, yes, thank you, Your Worship. And, 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 I, and I concur. You, you know, I think um, I see risk a, as a service level question. And, and, if, we, and if, if your infrastructure uh, is in a certain condition for a certain generation and not in the same condition for a, the next generation, uh, then that really is a service level cut that that increases the the district's risk uh, year over year, and 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 it's a small incremental decision that council makes year over year, and and so council can use debt to uh, to solve a lot of that in a quicker in a quicker way. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, the reason I, I put it to Mr. Payne is that I acknowledge um, his professional designation uh, as being the authority to actually make that comment rather than my own. And, and, and uh, perhaps that will uh, give uh, residents who, who um, do have some of those fears to have a greater trust in it. So thank you, Mr. Payne, for those comments. Yeah, th thank you, Councillor. I have Councillor Nay and then Councillor Braithwaite. Um, well, actually, I... Um... I, I really want to thank, um, through you, Mayor, um, Mr. Payne, the remarkable um, document you provided us with, uh, and uh, really clear and thoughtful and and uh, and thorough. So, uh, and congratulations on the award too. Uh, really well deserved, and uh, I really appreciated your uh, presentation. I I have to say the question I had was around. Um, are very low debt and ways that could be used. Um, it could be it could be used potentially uh, in the future. And as I listened to your responses to a couple of uh, um, uh, Councillor Patterson's questions, I, I think actually I'm just going to pass right now because I think, uh, uh, for my part, anyways, uh, you've uh, clarified uh, the queries I had regarding uh, debt and how it can be used. So I'll give a pass right now. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Nay. Councillor Braithwaite. Thank you so much. Um, uh, again, I'm going to reiterate uh, what a great uh, document this is. I think that last year it was fabulous to have something in, in this uh, presented to us in this way. This year it's even better. I can't wait till next year because it's going to be, I probably won't even have to read it. It'll just go through into my mind by osmosis or something. But it was uh, it was laid out really, really well and I really enjoyed uh, reading it. Um, my question is, um, on one of the slides you had, uh, Mr. Payne, it showed um, a percentage for a forced growth, a percentage for infrastructure and a percentage for new staffing. And I think um, when I looked at the numbers, I kind of quickly wrote them down. It was 2.65, 1.88, and 1.62. And I added those up and that comes to 6.15. And I know that you said that um, we were projecting 6.49. And I'm just wondering if I missed something or where that other about 0.34% or whatever would, would, would be. Yeah, uh, sure. Go ahead, Mr. Payne. You missed a little other 3.3.4 that or 0.34, whatever that popped up at the very end. Oh yeah, uh, I but, must have missed that. I didn't. I don't think I saw it. Uh, Mr. Payne, uh, are you are you going to cover off what that is? Uh, maybe just give us a quick overview now. Ah, there, other. Ah, it just says other. Okay, that's fine. I just missed that totally. So uh, thank it's you. a good time. We might as well ask the question though, Mr. Payne. Okay, can you just sure. give a quick overview of what the uh, what the 0.34 other is? You talked about the 0.17. Uh, Your Worship, it's. Uh, 
it's escaping me. I could, uh, I'm sure I could figure it out in, if everyone's willing to wait just 30 seconds here, I should have had this document. Open. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I uh, thought I would be ready to answer that one. Um, Oh, uh, Your Worship, uh, thank you for the question. Um, in this case, it's a $90,000 lease for the fire department apparatus bay. Uh, right, okay. Yeah, so that's Perfect. a uh, capital project coming coming forward, but there would be a, a lease for it, which would impact the taxes, yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much. That's the only question I have at this time. Okay, thank you. I don't, if we can go back to the, uh, to the squares here, I don't see any other hands up for questions at this time. So I'm, I'm if I'm not, sorry. I'll, oh, go ahead, Councillor Green. I'm sorry, Mary. I had my hand up, but I guess it. it seems oh, it's just not showing. It's not showing on here, but that's fine. I'm happy to. That's. I just expect people to speak up if they. If I say something and and I, I'm missing you, please just speak up. So, well done, Councillor Green. Go ahead. I think it's there now. Is it there now? Maybe it drops. It is. Off automatically. It is. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I want to join with other co uh, council colleagues to congratulate um, the Department of Finance and the municipality on the award. That's really wonderful. And also on the preparation to Mr. Payne of, of this report. And all of my questions have been answered. Um, the only one I was just wanting you to maybe comment on Mr. Payne following on um, Councillor Patterson's comments. Can you put in context for the public um, the, the power of borrowing and how that enables municipalities to tackle issues that they perhaps normally wouldn't be able to tackle um, with normal budgets and reserves. Would you be able to just a brief comment about how important borrowing can be to, to these kinds of issues? Thank you. Sure, thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, Mr. Payne. Uh, yes, Your Worship, uh, through to Councillor Green. Um, absolutely, and, and as mentioned, the municipalities have a tremendous opportunity that many other municipalities outside of BC don't have, and that's through borrowing through the Municipal Finance Authority. Uh, typically what cities actually do in the United States and other places is they issue their own bonds. And then the market prices the risk of that, of that municipality defaulting on those bonds. And, and the cost of that results in much higher interest and, and um, interest costs. Uh, so our, our um, regional district is, is liable for our debt. So every single municipality in the regional district um, basically signs on to our debt. So that defers the response, that defers um, uh, and reduces the risk. And then the Municipal Finance Authority itself is a taxing authority. They have a very small, very cheap line item on your tax bill. And they, but they can increase those taxes if they need to, if, if let's say the city of Vancouver defaulted on it, they could, they could raise the taxes. And we all know um, this year was a good example of how stable the tax, the property tax system is. So all of those combined, the market has recognized that there's very low uh, risk to borrowing. And we have that opportunity that nobody else has. And, and as I mentioned, the cost of borrowing itself through the Municipal Finance Authority is often below inflation. So if you're, um, uh, uh, so, so actually borrowing can, 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 cost, can cost less than just the regular, than your money just uh, being reduced in value year after year. Uh, so it, it provides an opportunity for municip municipalities to borrow uh, very quickly. There are legislative um, limits on how much we can borrow and we have to go to the electorate in, in most cases to ask for permission to borrow. Um, and so there, there, there are a lot of uh, uh, checks and balances uh, for borrowing. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the clarification. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, are there any other questions at this time? If not, I'm going to go to the public and let them ask some questions. If there are any, uh, I don't see any. So, Ms. Williams, would you please put up the, uh, the slide on screen here? Uh, I, will, I will do that. I'm about to share my screen. One moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you for putting up there. So just follow the instructions on the screen and you can, you'll have access. Uh, 
Mr. Payne, if, well, while we're waiting, I'm just going to ask a very quick question. Um, as we uh, contemplate um, the ideas of borrowing and as we have our asset management uh, knowledge come together, when do you sort of foresee timelines to us having those sorts of conversations about the possibility of, of, of addressing some of these costs through borrowing and doing some analysis of the value of, of borrowing versus uh, savings on using some of uh, as financial models going forward. Uh, Your Worship, the, um, the technical timeline that we've committed to in, in the uh, uh, priorities is uh, fall of uh, 2022. However, we're really keen on getting the infrastructure replacement plan to council in fall of 2021. I don't. I, I just don't want to have waited till 2022 uh, to to um, to do that plan. And and the partners, the engineering department in particular, is geared up uh, to do that as well. And and the reason for that is uh, for council to really consider the impacts of that report in budget. We need to have it presented to council before the budget season. And uh, so I, I would. I'm really keen on on having that before council at that point. If if the infrastructure replacement plan sort of demonstrates that. Uh, yeah, we our, our reserves might go down in the short term, but but they rebound and they rebound nicely because we've, we've built in sustainable funding. Um, then my recommendation will probably be let's just get a lot of capital done and let's use our reserves. If, however, um, you know our reserves would get too low uh, as re as a result of that analysis, then we'll probably say let's get a lot of capital done, but let's let's borrow to do it because I just. I don't think that there's any question that there's a there needs to be a lot of capital done. That's um, that's not really the question being asked. No, it is not. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Payne. Uh, all right, are there um, uh, Ms. Williams? Are there are there callers in the queue? Uh, no callers in the queue, Your Worship. But I do see a Mr. Wilmot has joined us, and he specifically registered to speak to item five point one. Sure. So I'm just wondering, Mr. Wilmot, if you are able to put your hand up and indicate if you'd wish to speak. Can you see his hand, Ms. Williams? Because I cannot. No, nope, there's no hands going up. Well, just in the interest, if he wishes to speak, do you want to try and uh, allowing him to unmute, or do you have? Does he have to make that request? Ah, he has just unmuted, unmuted. Mr. Okay. Wilmot. Are you there? Yes, I have. I've unmuted. Oh, <laughs> there we are. We can... uh, please state your name and your municipality of residence as you start your comments to council. Thank you. Uh, Mike Wilmot, W-I-L-M-U-T, and I live in Oak Bay. Welcome, Mr. Wilmot. Nice to, nice to hear from you. Okay, can I begin? You may. Okay. Um, I hope what you take, I'm going to say, is both helpful and positive. I spent some time reading the document. The individual sections are well explained, well written, and very informed. I was looking for answers to the big picture. How is Oak Bay going to address its $250 million infrastructure deficit to be fixed for the over the next 30 years, especially roads, uh, storm and sanitary sewers and buildings? What I'd hoped to see was the current state of these four assets on some sort of a grading system. And then the dollar account to be spent on these assets in the five-year plan. Thirdly, what is the grading system expected to do in terms of the ranking? And finally, maybe not immediately, but how is the five-year plan going to integrate into a long-term plan? For example, the mayor's plan, fund, and build. At some point, probably the planning is part of what we're talking about. If the answers are there to my question, then I could not find them. Maybe the staff is too close to explain the big picture. To sell this product, I suggest that someone prepare a one page summary headed our infrastructure deficit, where are we? That the lay person understand, can understand and get some people who are not experts to read the document to make sure that the average person in the community can understand exactly our infrastructure deficit, where are we? I don't think it's in the document. And if you wanna really sell the product, I think that this is the way, the most, one, a very important way, along with some of the other things people mentioned about 
uh, buying bonds and so on to to deficit to uh, cost out. But I think there's a vacuum here, and this is the question I think that most people in the community really want the answer to, and it's not doesn't come out, and I don't know how you'd find it. And I think people like me, or you could find other staff who aren't familiar exactly with what's going on to see if they understand and the, the questions I've asked are answered. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wilmot. I think um, I think in reading it, that most of that information is, is there, but you're right, it is not uh, in a single page or sort of here's all the pieces that we need uh, to move it forward and here's where we are at all those stages. Um, but I'm going to just allow Mr. Payne a, a chance to uh, talk about that sort of, you know, the planning portion of it, um, uh, the funding of it, and then the building of it, because they are all, um, you know, components that we have to undertake, and they're they're not all there, obviously, but we're we're working on them. Maybe you can just give a quick again overview of the of the state of 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 each of those, and and sort of at what point we might see the whole picture. Uh, you know, with, with all those pieces filled in. Uh, yes, Your Worship, am I, now's now a good time? Yeah, might as well, yeah. just uh, just give a quick overview. I think it's a it's a valid question. Yeah, yes, you, Your Worship, very, uh, very good, uh, um, very good question and, and valid comments. And, and I would, I would uh, tend to agree uh, with the gentleman that the, the big picture and the full picture is not there in the financial plan. We've attempted to, um, uh, start addressing uh, those questions in the financial plan, uh, but the, but more needs to come. And and I'm very keen and optimistic that those answers will come in the form of the infrastructure uh, uh, replacement plan in um, fall of 2021. And that plan should detail uh, a condition assessment of all our assets. So I believe Mr. Wilmot um, uh, was was asking about the grading of our assets. So it should detail a, a condition assessment. It should detail um, the current replacement cost of all of our assets. And when we, can, when we consider what the current replacement costs of all our assets are and how far along they are in their life cycle, and if we compare that to what our reserve balances are, the difference there is our infrastructure deficit or surplus, but I very highly doubt we're at a surplus position. <laughs> that will be detailed in, the, in, in that infrastructure uh, replacement plan. And then the question is, well, how is that integrated into the, um, the five-year financial plan? And, and the answer to that is, from that infrastructure replacement plan, we will ask council. Here's, the mo here's what the modeling shows uh, of where our funding is going and, and what our actual capital replacement has to be. Here's a number of options of how we can address that council. Do we want to implement tax increases over a 10-year period, a 20-year period? Do we want to take on debt? A number of other options. And then from those policy decisions from council, they will be referenced in the five-year financial plan and the infrastructure um, and the infrastructure modeling will be referenced such as that. And I really like the, the suggestion that a one-page summary or executive summary be prepared and someone in the community can read it to test for, um, for plain language because uh, I do like my accounting lingo. But it, the most important thing is that this plan is understandable, um, and so so that it, that it's uh, the importance is understood by the public. So I really like that suggestion. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Payne. I think that's a, that's a great summary. I, I think it's also important to recognize that uh, while we have to have all those pieces in place to do it completely, we've we've undertaken a number of things uh, in the meantime. Obviously, we're. we're We've added a lot of funding, as you pointed out, into those capital reserves, so we have the money to do the work when when we know, uh, you know, more specifically the need. Um, but we already know we're we're short, so we're, we've been increasing that. And I think also just knowledge that operationally there's been shifts as well, just uh, in this change of of volume of capital projects that we're undertaking. Uh, uh, there's been more staff added to public works and to engineering uh, to project manage those capital projects uh, as they're already ramping up, as you pointed out, uh, up to to six million last. Last year and, and up to 12 million this year. So, uh, you know, that's a um, those those increases are 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 already being dealt with operationally and financially. We're just um, that big picture that Mr. Wilmot re referenced. Uh, I, I love the idea of a one pager as well. I think that would work really well. Um, are, is there anybody else, uh, Ms. Williams, who has their hand up or has indicated they wish to speak? Uh, no, Your Worship. No other public participation at this time. Okay. 
Um, just but knocked over my uh, my water on my desk here. Uh, so with that, then, are there any other questions of council at this point? If not, I'll we'll move on to the uh, presentations. I'm not seeing any. Great. So let's just move to item six point one, the Greater Victoria Public Library budget. Oh, go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Sorry. <laughs> We'll have lots of time for more questions later as well, but but go ahead. Thank. Oops, sorry. I have to get to the buttons quickly, and I have two computers here and the book, so it gets difficult. Yeah, just just one thing that um, I was wondering about um, uh, with Mr. Payne's comments, and that is uh, often it, when we um, seek grant funding to uh, assistance with projects that we want to do, there is a requirement um, that the district have funding in place for the projects so that we do a portion and then a portion is funded through grants. I am just wondering if um, you could share any um, knowledge that you have from your experience, if, um, if having debt approval, uh, already resolved prior to undertaking um, the, the, the grant is, will actually still qualify us for the grant or if we actually have to have, have the funding in a reserve fund waiting for the project. Sure. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Uh, Mr. Payne. Thank you, Your Worship. I, in my experience, um, which I, I, there, there's not a ton of capital gra capital grants that I've been a part of, you know, m maybe less than 20 or so. Um, most of them are okay as long as you have a funding source set aside. Uh, certainly if you plan on taking a debt, but you haven't taken the legislative steps to secure that debt and, and secure approval of the elector, it might not be looked on uh, positively. But if you've taken those steps, you've basically secured the funding and they're okay with that. I have run into the situation before where that's not the case. And and, um, and in that case, what you could just do is use reserve funding that was set aside for something else for the project and then backstop the previous reserve with, with debt. So it's just kind of moving money around. So there's, there's usually a financial solution to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Just gonna look around one last time here for hands before I move on to the library. Don't see it. So uh, I'm on to um, agenda item 6.1, uh, Greater Victoria Public Library budget presentation. Um, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to introduce here or if we have uh, Mr. Payne, if you're doing the introduction. Uh, Your Worship, I hadn't prepared an, uh, an interruption because these folks uh, are, are so well respected <laughs> in the community. They don't uh, need a, uh, no. uh, uh, um, an introduction, but I do believe we have uh, Maureen with us and also uh, Paul, is that yes. correct, Maureen? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm, hello, Ms. Sawa. Hello. It's great to be here. We also have our new board chair, Councillor Andy McKinnon, and traditionally our board chair uh, makes a few very brief remarks before the presentation, and perhaps I will ask him to do that. I'm just trying to get the full um, screen up. Um, so Councillor McKinnon, would you like to make your remarks right now? I would love to, thanks so much, Maureen. Uh, good evening, Mayor Murdoch, uh, ex-chair of the Greater Victoria Public Library Board, uh, council members, staff, and, and also the public tonight. Thanks for inviting us to present our 2021 budget for 20. Uh, my name is Andy McKinnon. I'm chair of the Greater Victoria Public Library Board. Uh, I'm also council uh, representative for the District of Machosan. Uh, with me to present uh, today is our CEO, Maureen Sawa, and our Director of Finance and Facilities, Paul McKinnon. No relation. <laughs> I'd like to recognize Councillor Andrew Appleton, who is your council representative on the Greater Victoria Public Library Board. Uh, it's a pleasure to serve with Andrew and with all of the other dedicated Greater Victoria Public Library Board trustees. Andrew does a great job of representing Oak Bay on our board. Thank you, Andrew. Greater Victoria Public Library Board is committed to working with our 10 municipal partners so that together we can build inclusive and diverse communities. You've received our 2021 budget package in developing this budget. 
We had to balance the ongoing and uncertain effects of the COVID-19 pandemic with our needs to press forward, innovate and evolve our services. We recognize the ongoing challenges we all face as a result of COVID-19, including financial challenges. I'm the uh, chair of finance for the district of Machosan, so it's uh, very instructive to be at your budget meeting. I think we need a financial officer named Payne. That's excellent. <laughs> Uh, the library board and staff have worked hard to develop a budget for 2021 that takes the long view so we can continue to provide library services that are forward thinking and sustainable. On behalf of the library board, staff and the communities we serve, I'd like to express my thanks to council for your continued support. We're proud of the work we do and we appreciate uh, your recognition that libraries are more important now than ever in these uncertain times. And now I'll turn things over to Maureen for the remainder of the presentation. Maureen, Paul and I look forward to responding to any questions you might have. Maureen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So um, again, good evening, everyone. I know this is a long night for you, so I will try to be uh, quick, um, but I do always like to begin these presentations by reminding everyone that the Greater Victoria Public Library is a shared system serving 10 of the 13 municipalities in the Capital Regional District. And as you know, what that means is that our geographic service area encompasses not only the core and district municipalities of Oak Bay, Victoria, Saanich and Esquimalt, but the West Shore cities of Colwood and Langford, the town of U Royal, and the district municipalities of Highlands and Machosan, as well as the district municipality of Central Saanich on the Saanich Peninsula. Within these boundaries, we also provide service to First Nations people and other residents living on the reserve lands of the Songhees, the Sarlat, Salat, Esquama, and Beecher Bay. Um, so in total, we serve a population of over 350,000 um, individuals with a physical collection of close to 670,000 items and a virtual branch which is open 24 seven. The advantages to each and every one of our member municipalities, no matter how large or small, is that citizens of all 10 municipalities have access to services and collections that normally would only be available to large urban municipalities. Um, and I would just like to note that we are actually considered a large urban library system and thus um, our statistics are compiled by the Canadian Urban Libraries Council and we continue to rank as one of the highest per capita circulating large urban library systems in Canada. Expectations for our service delivery are high and we are known for punching well above our weight. And this year in particular, I think it's very important to have that lens as we uh, look ahead um, to the coming year, but also look, uh, look back on the year that we've been through. <laughs> now it wouldn't be a library budget presentation without a literary quote. And this one seemed to say it all. Um, it is an understatement to say that we all wish that it need not have happened in our time, but so it has. The pandemic has presented challenges that are truly unprecedented, but with these challenges came opportunities to accelerate change. And I would just like to, I can't believe it's almost gonna be a year since, uh, since the, uh, the big shutdown. Um, and I will never forget that day when we, we all had to close down all the libraries in British Columbia. Um, and at the time you may remember, there was a lot of talk about people hoarding toilet paper and what I observed was people hoarding library books and it was it was actually uh, quite the moment in my career. However, um, we, we have um, taken advantage of, of um, some of the opportunities that technology has made possible for us. I hope that you are all familiar with this image, GVPL's homepage for our virtual branch which has remained open every single day since the pandemic began. And in fact, after the initial shock of shuttering our doors and the imperative for everyone to stay home and not go out, that was what we turned our immediate action to was building our community living room in a virtual world so that those in physical isolation were not forced to also be socially isolated. Just as the library's physical branches traditionally offer an oasis, for all ages and interests, so also would gvpl.ca become the equivalent online. And we were very um, fortunate to be ahead of the game. Um, many of my colleagues and other library systems had to scramble because um, they did not already have online library card registration. 
And we had uh, introduced that in 2017, which was really helpful for our residents who could very quickly sign on to the virtual branch, which as I explained, was open 24 seven um, right through this whole time. With the suspension of the physical access to our facilities, a core group of staff was designated to maintain an addition to essential infrastructures to quickly pivot to develop our, our resources for our online library. Um, staff revisited licensing terms for electronic products, along with increasing the size of our ebook and e audio collections. It was quite um, an amazing time. Um, the online library card registration increased by 500% in the first months of our physical branch closures. Digital usage increased by 77% compared to the same period in 2019. It would be impossible to overstate the importance of the library's role in providing a connection and activity and a sense of uncertainty during such uncertain times. I'm very, very proud of the work that the staff has done in that regard. Um, in addition to the diversion of funds and staff expertise to the rapid deployment of new and expanded online resources, it's important to note that there were um, brand new pressures on our IT infrastructure as a result of the all of a sudden um, staff working remotely, working at home. You know, we had to quickly um, provide them with um, the tools in which they could work from home remotely. This required an outlay of funds for laptops, dedicated time for training and setup, all of which was compounded by our new WorkSafe BC guidelines that we had to follow, not just on, on site for those staff that were still able to come into the workplace, but um, to ensure that people were following safe WorkSafe BC guidelines in their home situation. All the while that we were focusing on our digital services, we were cognizant of the yearning for a return to some sort of normal by so many of our patrons whose desire to hold a real book in their hands and return to their neighborhood branch was first and foremost in their hearts. So during the time before the reopening of our branches at the end of June, 46,000 holds were placed. So I just wanna very quickly review um, our service restoration plan. You may recognize some staff from the Oak Bay branch. These photos are where um, we have reimagined um, the space um, following directives from WorkSafe BC the BC Ministry of Health um, and best practices developed by other library systems, we, we evolved a plan. Um, one of the things that some of you may be um, aware of is that one of the complications of reopening for services was the mandate that we quarantined all returned uh, library materials for 72 hours. Um, this went on right through until the middle of November when new BC CDC guidelines um, for public libraries were issued and we have subsequently reduced our quarantine time to 24 hours. However, until this development, the quarantine of returned materials placed a significant complication on workflow processes materials handling given the volume of materials this system circulates so we had we had complications that um you know sometimes difficult to explain but with the oak bay branch in particular and i'll speak to that a little later um there had been significant challenges because of the the layout of the building however in our service restoration um Phase two, um, you know, we opened Oak Bay um, for modified in branch library services um, in the summer. Uh, our holds pickup um, service, which we have been very, very happy with. I, I know not everyone's happy with the speed sometimes, but that's because we've got a lot of materials that were circulating. And as you can see by this illustration of one of our staff unloading the van, um, we move a lot of materials among a very um, broad geographic distance, which was um, one of the things I, I wanted to emphasize when we started. Throughout the rollout of reopenings, we learned that those branches with the greatest flexibility of space allowed for increased capacity for collections and occupancy. Here's a photo of one of our newer branches, the Shuenhan Tanho James Bay branch, and as you can see, if you know that branch, it, it didn't really change that much. Um, as with all branch locations, we have had to allocate some public space uh, for WorkSafe BC approved staff work areas. And we've been able to do that much more easily in the branches that are, are wide open with flexible space. 
all the while that we were um, working on our physical um, space, um, we, we continued to serve as an important community hub. Um, our telephone um, service, uh, as illustrated by one of our staff, um, as you can see, she's at the computer, also on the phone. Um, GVPL staff have taken on a huge role in supporting those who continue to shelter in place and are wanting to fully utilize the library's virtual branch. With over 37,000 digital collection items, which were added to our virtual branch and new products, we are really um, providing a lot of service to those individuals who want to become more proficient online, but they do not anymore have the wherewithal or the comfort level to invite anyone into their homes to help them. So we're doing a lot of um, work over the phone um, and it's been very popular for new years of our virtual branch. For many of our elders, um, the option of inviting a family member or a friend to assist them with their home electronic devices is no longer an option. We also provide in-person customer support services, as you can see by the picture on the right. As mentioned, um, we had an extraordinary amount of items on loan at the time of the branch closures. And one of the things that we, we made a point of doing until the last of our 12 branches reopened in October, our due dates were extended for all those materials so that no overdues Oh, no overdue fines would be incurred. We knew that there were many individuals who preferred to wait until their home branch was reopened. So that's another piece of information that gradual return of materials did impact our ability to fill holds over the summer, but with the browsing collections in all formats available now at all branches, circulation is steadily returning to previous levels. So just very, very quickly, I wanna mention that we're now in service restoration phase three. Um, we are delighted to be reintroducing programs such as our, our, our seed libraries. Um, many of the uh, programs have gone virtual. A particular interest um, I believe to Oak Bay would be our uh, transitioning of the emerging local authors collection. Lots of writing occurred this past year with many, many people um, at home um, doing their uh, creative juices. Um, so this year we have 119 local authors and illustrators um, represented in the 2021 collection, which is now available for borrowing with both ebook and traditional formats. And you will be interested to know that seven of our authors are from Oak Bay. In terms of phase three, as you can see, um, the, the Oak Bay branch, um, and we will soon be, um, we are starting to reintroduce computer service, um, again, slowly because of the, uh, the spacing issues that we have. Um, but we're, we're quite um, happy with the way things have been going. So now I just want to very, very quickly go through the 2021 budget. Um, uh, and I know you, you will have questions about this. Um, as Councillor McKinnon um, noted, um, you have the package. The total municipal uh, contribution amount requested for 2021 by the Greater Victoria Public Library is being held at last year's requisition resulting in a 0% increase in the overall municipal requisition. We have worked very hard to realize this through operational efficiencies, as well as reduced expenses from the 2020 service adjustments obviously had an impact um, so that we could forecast savings for 2021 that reflect COVID-19 service levels. Due to the temporary suspension of in-branch services, underspending of some areas of our 2020 budget occurred, and these operating budget savings um, have been uh, have served to partially offset um, the loss of revenues, as well as the increased expenditures relating to um, COVID expenses such as PPE, increased security and janitorial um, cleaning services and supplies. This 20, 2021 budget will allow us to continue and advance the important work to reach out to connect with and inspire our communities. It is a very sustainable budget. Um, and as you can see, the District of Oak Bay 2021 contribution is noted here. Um, it's as always, um, each municipality's contribution is based on the converted assessment values and population of the municipalities, including rental adjustments. So in the case of Oak Bay this year, um, there is, a, there is a significant reduction from your 2020 share. Um, your share this year of the overall budget is 6.24%. Last year it was 6.65%. So with the flat increase, this is actually going to be a contribution decrease this year of $72,285. 
Looking ahead, uh, you'll, you'll recognize behind the mask, um, Councillor Appleton on a recent visit to the branch. Uh, Councillor Appleton, we were very appreciative that he came to visit us after uh, one of the many rainstorms that have occurred in the area. And we had some flooding at Oak Bay. Um, I, I was very interested to hear the discussion about asset management because certainly the Oak Bay branch is, is definitely a candidate for um, I'll say very gently improvements. Um, and I hope that we'll have an opportunity to talk about that um, at some point. Um, but again, um, it's a very, very well used branch. It's our second busiest in the system. Um, and that that's an, a lovely photo. And we are grateful when our councillor representatives um, take the time to come and speak to staff and to our patrons. We um, have certainly uh, succeeded in delivering on our 2016-2020 strategic plan. Um, if, if COVID had not taken place, um, our new strategic plan um, was to have been developed and, um, and planned with community consultation in 2020. Obviously that was not uh, possible, but we will be fast accelerating that process so that um, we will continue um, with uh, our strategic planning process now that our new board has been established. Um, again, the Oak Bay branch and other facilities are certainly um, going to be uh, priorities for discussion at the board level. Um, and having said that, I'm going to wrap up with yet another quote. This came from one one of the uh, other libraries in British Columbia, but I think it says it all during the pandemic, library service is one of the safest forms of public service that municipalities offer. With online programs and borrowing of items to enjoy in people's own homes, keeping libraries safely open should be a priority for every municipality that wants to provide outlets for mental stimulation and social connections. And now the illustration, for those of you who haven't been downtown for a while, um, this is one of the GVPL doors on what's called Library Lane in downtown Victoria. But I was really struck when this, uh, when this was done by our graphic artist, uh, who would have thought that the title How to Survive a Plague would, would resonate um, as kind of the big idea of 2020. So I, I had to include that. In conclusion, I would say just as everyone, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has challenged us in ways we previously thought unimaginable. In the process, it has laid bare large portions of our society who were not equipped with the resources, technology, or ability to adapt to a world with fewer physical connections and an ever increasing reliance on digital tools and skills. These inequities are not the result of COVID-19, but the pandemic has cast them under a stark spotlight. So um, with my colleagues and, and the other libraries in BC, we are working uh, to remove barriers that lead to so social isolation by providing the technology resources and expertise needed to facilitate access to government and, gov and community services while bringing people together to build community connections. We, through public funds, allow people to get lost in a book, learn a new skill, stream a thought provoking film and so much more. And during the pandemic, these escapes and opportunities are so important for the ongoing mental health and well being of our citizens. Um, there's a quote that basically I'd like to end up saying when you read a book, it allows you to go somewhere without without moving. And I think that's what reading and the online resources have done. So I'm going to conclude. I, I was conscious of the time. I, I would be happy to answer any questions, but my uh, colleague, our Director of Finance and Facilities, Paul McKinnon is here um, and we invite um, questions or comments uh, both about the budget or, or any of the resource development and our service restoration plan. And thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Sawa. And uh, thank you all for uh, uh, Chair McKinnon and uh, uh, Mr. McKinnon. Uh, please, uh, nice to have you both, all of you here with us as Maureen. It's nice to hear your voice. Um, are there any questions of our guests or of our uh, staff in relation to the presentation that was given? And perhaps I can ask Ms. Williams, if you can put all of our, our faces back on the screen, then I can see hands being raised. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. If we can ask uh, Maureen, if you could just do a stop share on your screen. I will. Yes. Thank okay. you. Thank all you. right. That works. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? I, I'll give uh, Councillor Appleton, do you, do you wish to say a few words? I, I, I hear nothing but great work of the work that you're doing on that, on that board and uh, definitely appreciate the the time and effort you put in there. So uh, do you have a few words to say? Absolutely, yes. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I appreciate that. And I'll try to, I'll try to be brief. 
Um, I think that what it comes out in the presentation that you've just heard is, um, you know, just how, uh, how challenging a year it's been for the library. Uh, it, let's, uh, we've had a flood at the Oak Bay branch. Um, the system as a whole was barely recovering from the flood pre-COVID um, at the Juan de Fuca branch. Uh, so staff were already, you know, highly challenged. Um, I was really pleased to um, to hear the mention of some of the constraints with, with two two important pieces being mentioned together, and, and Ms. Sawa mentioned the same thing. Um, we're talking about infrastructure. We're talking about capital replacements. Um, this has really been brought sort of really into clarity for me at our branch this year because. Staff had to deal with that flood not too long ago. Um, and then in the challenges of physically uh, uh, organizing the building in order to respond to COVID and how restricting that was in, in a lot of ways. So, uh, you know, I, I was just so blown away by going to the branch, basically you know, a day and a bit after the flood and they were drying things out and fans were going. And you think about how bad this, you know, th this could have been. That's usually where the computers are and they weren't there because of COVID. And there was, you know, there, they didn't even hit, get any books hit, which was just blind luck just because of the organization of things. But the attitude um, and just the, the, the positivity and the energy that the staff were bringing, I mean, I, it just... It, it could have been a disaster. It's flooded. Everybody's dealing with crazy stuff. And everybody just said, I want to get the branch back open. I'm happy we can have people back in here. We're just really excited about it. So uh, kudos to all the staff and, and, to, the, and to Maureen and crew for, for getting that organized. So, um, and, I, and I just want to very, very briefly uh, acknowledge that you know, we're, we're a year into this COVID thing and we've kind of gotten used to the way we've, of, of operating, but I just really want to acknowledge the staff of the GVPL who, when the system was closed, when COVID came in, the system was closed. Many staff were not able to work. Um, you know, there was an extended period of time where those folks couldn't come and do what they're passionate about. Um, and we, we can see it now in retrospect that now we've come up with a way of doing things. But if you cast your mind back to earlier this year, they weren't sure, we, we as the board and everybody collectively weren't sure when those people were going to be able to come back and, and how and in what format, how quickly, what sorts of restrictions were going to be there. So I just really want to acknowledge the big chunk of the year that uh, the staff of the of the library system spent being very uncertain and very anxious and very uh, anxious to get back at it. Uh, and now that the branch is back open again, what I hear from people is just their excitement of of serving the community and getting people back in. And and uh, you know they were they were stressed out mostly because they just wanted to be back out doing their jobs and getting out into the, into the community again. So it's been very. Uh, it's been very gratifying. So, um, you know, again, as we have this discussion about assets um, and long-term asset management, we talked about the infrastructure uh, replacement plan. Uh, this is very much on my mind, how valuable that building is and that, uh, that, that uh, facility is for our community. So thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Councillor Appleton. Uh, are there any other questions of, uh, of uh, GBPL? It's, it's much better when you come with, with good news. You're reducing our costs. Is, uh, the, 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 the concerns are much lower. Um, Councillor, sorry, Councillor Green, did I see a hand come up there or not? I just, uh, corner uh, my Yes, eye. I have my hand up. I, I was just going to make a, a few very brief comments. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, it, it's, it, it is really wonderful to hear Ms. Allen's voice again. And I always enjoy the, um, the library's presentation, knowing how much it means to this community. And, and thank you to the chair also. Mr. McKinnon for attending tonight. Um, I think the old saying, when the, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And this is certainly true for, for the library system and, and staff as Councillor Appleton has pointed out. And I really appreciate the presentation. Um, I, I know that the library and books in and of, the, of themselves have probably had their greatest test this past year, but have probably, um, achieved their greatest meaning as well, because I think people found great solace in books and online services. So thank you very much. And um, I really appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Green. Um, I don't see any other questions. I just have a question, uh, not for GVPL uh, staff, but just to Mr. Payne. Uh, is this draft budget then included in our current numbers for our budget? Your Worship, yes, the, these numbers have been in, integrated into our current draft. 
Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I don't see any other hands, so I think a, a great presentation, Ms. Awa and, Mr. and uh, Chair McKinnon as well. Uh, thank you very much for the information. Good news all around, and uh, very nice to, uh, to see you and, and hear you uh, again. It's been a long time, so uh, take good care, and thanks for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, and you all take good care as well. Thank you. Have a, have a good rest of the evening. Thank you. You too. Bye. Um, with that, we're just uh, moving on to the South Island Prosperity Fund budget presentation. And uh, Ms. Williams, I'm assuming you're handing over the reins to... Uh... I see uh, Dallas on with us. Yes, Your Worship, it's uh, uh, Christopher Payne speaking. Um, Dallas Gislason, and I apologize, Dallas, if I've mispronounced your last name, uh, is with us from the South Island Prosperity uh, Project. Uh, Dallas is the uh, uh, Director of Economic Development, so we're quite happy to have him here. Uh, the reason that I invited the South Island Prosperity Project um, to this year's budget presentation is because it is a, a, a renewal period, uh, so it's another five-year uh, request. And if council uh, approves a consolidated budget, then um, the, this, uh, the five-year request will be um, integrated into the five-year financial plan. Uh, so Dallas, I've got um, the uh, letter that was sent to council and I can put it up on the screen if that, if you would prefer or, or we can do anything else if you would prefer. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I, uh, so as uh, Mr. Payne alluded, I, I don't have a, a slide deck this evening or anything, um, just mainly because we were just uh, with you, I don't know when that was, a couple months ago anyways, uh, to present uh, some you know recent developments with our work. And uh, the letter really speaks to and refers to that, that uh, presentation. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just here mainly to, to answer questions and, and sort of if there's anything in the letter or the, or the financial model that uh, uh, Mayor or Council have questions on. I'm happy to answer that. I will uh, just allude to a couple things. Um, one is just the just to point out that um, with the five-year renewal, uh, originally, if you go back five years when we were created, the, the plan was to create and, and update the model using the uh, 2016 uh, census information and and a more recent uh, tax year for the for the as we know the model is a is a per capita in combination with 0.07% of, of tax levied. And, and so those amounts are there in the left-hand column. So that's the, 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 the renewed model would have been, would have looked like that. And what we would have brought forward um, for you would have been uh, that. Um, however, uh, just not unlike many other uh, organizations and, and, and aspects of the pandemic is that we've said, okay, why don't we just keep our funding level the same? Um, and so in the column there where it says year one proposed, that's just the current, uh, the current model that we've been operating under for the last five years. And so we've said, well, why don't we just keep that the same and then build in sort of an inflationary increase over the next five years. And then uh, the, the other thing I'll point out is if you look at the last column there, the 2025, is that the amount is actually uh, you know, relatively the same or a little bit less than the, than the original proposed uh, amount that would have been increased for for using the 2016 census and a, and a more recent uh, tax year. Um, so, basically, what we're saying is we'll we'll sort of phase our way into into what would have been a uh, intended to be an increase. But so that's sort of the 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 picture of of the model and and those on the screen, of course, are are the other participating uh, municipalities that 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 make up the the self and prosperity partnership model on the on the municipal side. And then, so right now we're actually uh, engaged in a strategic planning process with the board. Um, we had our, our first session um, yesterday, actually, yesterday morning, and we have another session planned in, in the first week of March, and we'll be tabling a, a three-year strategic plan in the context of a 20-year um, vision. Um, and of course, a lot of that work builds upon the work that uh, we had, we've been doing uh, through the pandemic with the Rising Economy Task Force, and creating a, the, the regional um, economic recovery plan, which was released in November. And so how our plan will work is we'll, we'll really use that plan to focus our work for the next uh, coming fiscal year, you know, 12 months to 18 months-ish, depending on how the, the pandemic uh, rolls out and the vaccines and the reopening and all that kind of stuff. So we're sort of assessing that every quarter as we go um, and then building into a more 
uh, you know, an economic development strategy that looks at resilience and job creation and all the other aspects, of course, that uh, other aspects of our work. So anyway, that's, that's all I'll, I'll say for now. And I'm happy uh, to entertain any questions um, or, or leave you to, uh, to discuss. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Gislason. Uh, is there, are there any questions uh, from council? And I think we can pull the, um, the slide up here again, just helpful for me if I can see faces. So perhaps if we can unshare the, the letter, we can, uh, we can see our members of council here. Uh, Councillor Nade, did you want to, as you're the newly appointed uh, representative for the South Island Prosperity Partnership. Uh, so you're probably getting up to speed on things, but do you, do you have I, any questions or any comments to start? No, I, I, I am getting up to speed and I've attended a couple meetings now and, uh, and there's some really, uh, and Councillor Hazel, Hazel um, Braithwaite, <laughs> sorry, Hazel, Hazelwaite, <laughs> Braithwaite, yeah, she, she's uh, attending and involved as well um, after, um, since the beginning of this year as well. But um, I, I have to say that it's, it's very impressive, the work uh, that SIPS has done uh, it, it, around the reboot and recovery and next steps uh, project, uh, really impressive document and the consultation with the municipal um, folks uh, last week uh, was very engaging. And um, I, I think it produced some really good information. So a lot of, um, it's not just about plans, it's about a lot of action uh, anticipated over the next while and some really good pathways that have been set up by SIP. So I think we should all be really grateful for this work because it's such a key part of uh, what happens for all of us in the region, how they're able to help facilitate and um, uh, the, the uh, recovery that, uh, and, and create, you know, a real more um, resilient economy is it, it's what's anticipated and an adaptation to um, the issues around climate change, et cetera. So uh, yeah, great work. Thank you very much, Dallas, for your coming out and presenting the numbers here. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much for the, for the, the words, uh, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Ney. Are there any uh, questions? I'm not seeing any. I just have a couple, if I may. The, um, when this uh, was started five years ago, uh, it was largely funded by municipalities. Uh, just at the time, there weren't a lot of businesses that I caught into it. And, and you've added quite a, few, a, a significant number of uh, businesses, most of the significant financial institutions and the universities and all kinds of other pieces. I'm curious about what, where uh, my anticipation of that in the fifth year or sixth year with that, the municipal proportion of that would drop as the, uh, as the businesses that benefit uh, from the economic development would, would be contributing more. Is that uh, at all in the plan or is the intention here to kind of essentially keep the percentages uh, uh, the way they are? Yeah, good, good question. Um, in terms of the percent of the overall budget, you're, you're exactly right. In the first year, uh, municipalities uh, contributed about 70, a little over 70% of the, of the entire budget. Um, the budget was designed originally when the organization was, was developed uh, to be about a million dollars a year. So that's sort of a, that, was, that number was selected deliberately. Uh, you looking at other, what other cities are, it's still substantially lower than what other uh, metropolitan areas in Canada are, are invest in this uh, type of work, but it was seen as, an, as a good starting point to, in, a, in a region that hadn't really collaborated regionally on this sort of work in the past. So it was a good starting point. And so if going back to 2016 is the municipalities uh, contributed uh, roughly about 70, we were a little bit less than a million dollars a year at the time, but it was roughly about 70%. And then the intent as uh, Mayor Murdoch uh, uh, alluded, uh, was that as more businesses came on, the percentage of the total would actually decrease. Um, but that's not uh, to say that the, the, the funding level of, from municipal governments would decrease. It just means that the overall budget uh, for the work uh, would, would increase. Um, and so the, 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 what we're attempting to do there is actually creating a leverage for you. So we're, we're saying if the municipal portion remains relatively consistent uh, over time, which, which the, the letter shows sort of that it, that's, that's the case, relatively consistent. Um, it certainly has been the last five years, but our intent is, is then to create leverage. So for every dollar you put in, 
um, that the amount that we're leveraging in terms of the, the programmed spend from other parties actually goes up and up and up. And those other parties include private sector, uh, as the mayor mentioned, but also senior levels of government. So we, we've been uh, you know, successful in getting uh, over a million dollars in, in program funds. So those are money that goes right into our projects that we're, that we're leading. Um, from the federal government, the provincial government uh, is, is a little bit of a different story. They're they're not quite uh, substantially invested in economic development in the capital region. Um, however, we we are feeling optimistic about some of the projects right now because um, we we with the new government, uh, the new new cabinet uh, being sworn in recently, we've had some really positive meetings on that on that front, particularly around the the First Nations uh, economic development file, um, and around potentially. Uh, establishing a, a marine innovation, basically a center that's going to help us uh, transform our marine and, and uh, industries around uh, addressing, you know, cleaner, cleaner, uh, uh, cleaner industry transformation. Let's put it that way. But very does good. That so the question. It does uh, to a degree. In, and what's the total annual budget then right now with with SIP? Uh, I don't have the exact budget in front of me, but we we, we average around. Um, just shy of a million dollars in operating uh, budget per year. So if you if I, if I go back to the letter, um, the municipal portion of that right now is six hundred and twenty one thousand. Mm -hmm. So it's roughly sixty percent. So it's down from seventy. So that sort of it sort of trends downward over time. Okay. And then and that's that's not including the project funding. So we have um, you know money that we've raised to put into projects. So for example, this ocean fund we actually just spun out a an entirely separate organization that's going to be, uh, and they just incorporated actually last week uh, to, to lead the establishment of a ocean innovation hub. So they'll, they'll raise project funding that's, that goes into that, which we're helping uh, to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the other question I have is just around the, uh, the allocation. I know this is sort of a, a formula that's probably been just generally adopted in the municipal side of things, this sort of uh, mix of tax base and assessed value and, and population. But you know, if you look at equivalent size municipalities in the region that have substantially more uh, by you know, orders of magnitude, more commercial and, and light industrial space to benefit from the growth like Colwood or Esquimalt, uh, they're paying really substantially less than, than Oak Bay is by, uh, by $10,000 or so, about, uh, about 30% less. So I'm just wondering if that formula is where that came up with and, and, and why, why, why so heavy to Oak Bay uh, on our residential taxes when we're a very, very indirect benefit of, of, the, of the economic growth. I'm not arguing we're not a benefit beneficiary, but we're definitely less direct than any of the other jurisdictions would be. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So basically what was done, uh, this would have been in, in fall 2015 when the model was proposed is that um, we worked with the founding group of uh, municipal reps at the time um, who were getting together to, to, to sort of hash this out and, and what the model would look like. And we put together uh, five different funding models that, that uh, I mean, there was a whole bunch of the discussion on how to do it, but essentially we arrived at five different models. Um, and, and just like you said, so there was a model that was a pure population model where it was, it was based on a per capita allocation uh, only. It didn't involve any looking at tax at all. And that model was not attractive because uh, for the reasons you've mentioned, uh, Saanich would be the highest uh, contributor um, when, when their argument is that the city of Victoria actually has a, a, a larger tax, tax base in the sense of commercial values and things like that. And so they said, well, that model doesn't work for us. Um, and so the other models involved looking at a pure commercial um, assessment in combined with population. And then the other one was an overall tax assessment combined with, with population. And so those models, and I can actually, I, I can actually send you this if you want to look at the old models and, and see what it looks like. Um, but essentially the, the, the members at the time uh, felt that the overall tax blend was the best, most representative option, mainly because um, when you think about economic development, municipal governments tend to think of economic development in terms of land use and getting value from land. Whereas the SIT model actually, what, what we think of is actual household prosperity. So we think of the ability for someone to increase their, um, their income 
uh, or to find a job or to uh, move up in a career ladder type of situation. So that's sort of the, the model. We don't take a, a like our, our measurement, nothing in our measurement it has to do with land uh, use. Uh, so so the, the fact that there's commercial, you know, it's disproportionate. There's, you know, central Senate has 18% of all industrial land in the, in the CRD, for example. We don't take that into account in the model. It's more about household prosperity. And that's why the, the, the third model, which was the overall uh, tax assessment was, was selected in combination with the, the population. But I, I'm happy to show you the old models and, and uh, if, if not members, tonight, you know, they, not tonight, no, <laughs> no. But I'm saying if members <laughs> want to revisit that, um, that that's, that's something that the members would have to bring forward and, and, and bring that to the board and say, Hey, we want to get this on the agenda. Perhaps at the AGM as something that can be revisited. The the key to all this, however, though, is that all mem- like all of our municipal members really like the municipal members of SIP are really the that's our key stakeholder. Like the other ones are 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 an added bonus in my, in my perspective, but the municipal governments are really the key stakeholder of of the work. And that's just, that's the same if you were to go to to Calgary or Vancouver or anywhere else. It's the municipal government that, that really is the key stakeholder in the in the economic development agenda. Um, but so if, so if all the municipal members got together and said, "Hey, we want to revisit the model and change it," and they all agreed to that, that that's the most important part for me. It's not w- whatever model works is irrelevant to us. We just want we want our municipal partners to be to be happy and and more importantly, or as importantly, I'll say, uh, to be collaborative. So they want to see the equity and that the model is sound and fair and that. You know, everybody thinks it's uh, it's it thinks it's those things. Thanks, Dallas. I I, I guess a lesson here is I, I think it may it may be, you know be a, a consideration as for the council for sure. Um, but it's a uh, the other lesson of that is be at the table early so you get to be part of those discussions when they're when those decisions are being made. So, uh, well, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And and uh, Oak Bay was represented. Just it wasn't uh, it wasn't this council. They had this, it, yeah, no, no, it's good. Here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you. Um, are there any other questions for Dallas at this time? Not seeing any. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks for your patience waiting for us to get through the other agenda items and uh, have yourself a great evening. Anything you wish to add before you, before we send you, let you go and relax a little bit more? No, no. I, I just wanted to say that I actually quite enjoyed the, the budget presentation. It was uh, really interesting, actually. It's, I mean, I'm not just saying that to uh, but it was really interesting. So I can see why uh, Mr. Payne is uh, winning awards for his work because it's, it's actually, I, you know, it'd be great if more people could, could watch and sort of learn how this stuff uh, comes together. So anyways, th- have a good evening and thanks again. Yeah, thank you, Dallas. All right, thank you very much. And uh, I am going back to my agenda here. Sorry, I skipped over to the letter <laughs> for my own following. Um, next up, we have a special initiatives presentation. I believe I'm going back to you, Mr. Payne. Uh, yes, Your Worship. And uh, what I'm planning to do here is actually just uh, present uh, the financial plan on the screen so that folks that are watching from home um, can, uh, can see it, if that's okay with you. That is great. And what I'll just say is that um, for, I think a few more people may have joined us just to watch uh, and, and possibly ask questions. So uh, if you have, we've done the general uh, financial plan overview presentation. Uh, we've now completed 6.1 and 6.2, which are our uh, delegates that have come and presented um, uh, that we fund uh, or may fund. And then we have, uh, we're just going through the next set of stages in terms of special initiatives, corporate administration, uh, et cetera. So, um, what I'll do is uh, after the presentation portion of this, I will invite councillors to ask questions and then I'll go to the public and our staff will put up, uh, if, you're, if you're wishing to speak, if you're a member of the public, uh, the, the details of how to call in, uh, you'll call in by a phone number, uh, will be flashed up on screen and uh, you'll be able to, uh, to call in and ask questions. Uh, if you miss that opportunity, uh, we'll call that at every point. And so you can always uh, ask questions about an earlier uh, section as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, with that, um, I, um, I'm just going to hand this over to Mr. Payne. Great. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. And I'm presuming you can see the special initiatives uh, chart on the screen now? We can. Thank you. Great. What I'm going to do, Your Worship, is I'm going to introduce some of the uh, projects on here. They should all be familiar to Council. Some are brand new. Um, Many of these projects uh, have already been um, discussed at length 
at our recent uh, strategic planning um, meeting on January 28th. So I might not discuss them in the same amount of uh, detail. Uh, we do have uh, the directors available uh, for questions um, if I don't cover anything in, in my presentation. Um, uh, we've color coded some of our schedules a little bit now to help, uh, help folks organize. Uh, the brown coding, uh, the brown shading there is, is stuff that existed in the previous year financial plan and has been carried over. Uh, so there's less attention paid to those since they're kind of already approved by council. So the first uh, project that I'll just note on here is the infill housing. Um, this project was recently prior prioritized above the village area plan at the January 28th meeting uh, and the session. And staff had indicated that a 2023 completion timeline was, um, was practical. Uh, but council asked staff to come back with the, what, what would the resources uh, take? What resources would it take to escalate that timeline? And so staff is doing that research as we speak and there's a, an expected delivery of that information uh, to council in uh, March. Thank you. Just Mr. Payne, before you go further, I just want to let anybody who is watching this presentation, if you uh, are on our agenda and you download the, the draft financial plan version one, uh, you will find this chart on page 15 of that report. So if you want to see the details and scroll and understand uh, the color coding, which is at the bottom of the page, um, you can find it on page 15 of the financial report, just to make it easier for everybody to follow at home. Uh, so go ahead, Mr. Payne. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. And I intended to note the page numbers as I scroll through, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to do that uh, moving forward. Uh, so the next project on this list uh, that I'm uh, discussing is the village area plan and, and this the village area plans were prioritized after the infill housing at the January 28th strategic priority meeting. Uh, so we have a, a 2022 uh, funding uh, timeline in the financial plan. And the next project is the comprehensive zoning uh, bylaw update and uh, the timeline for this uh, hasn't changed with uh, the work beginning in 2023 anticipated completion in 2024. So we funded the entirety of it in 2023. Council will note that there has been a price change to this project of an additional $50,000. And that's to support a robust uh, public engagement process as well as additional legal review that may be required. Uh, so the leadership team had, had a bit of a closer look at that project and is recommending an additional $50,000. And that's been integrated into the, um, uh, the, the draft financial plan. I will note that the housing, the housing framework in its totality is, is demonstrated on page 17 on the financial plan. It's kind of a little snapshot of all the pieces that are fitting together and the current proposed timeline for all of those. So staff or the council want, want to look at that at some point, it's a good, uh, it's a good summary. The next piece I'll, I'll talk about here is uh, the emergency plan. Um, so this uh, project has been car carried uh, forward. It was, uh, and it did not commence in 2020. Uh, the province is modernizing the Emergency Program Act and the district needs to update its plan to reflect the new legislative accountabilities. Uh, there is a slight increase to this project, $5,000 recommended, uh, just recognizing that uh, consult the cost of consulting has gone up because uh, we believe the pandemic has increased the uh, demand for those consultants. There's a pent up demand that, that we're expecting. So there's a slight um, price change on that one. A new project on this list is the Occupational Disability uh, and Claims uh, Management Program. Uh, the district's work safe premiums have been escalating at a, a, a decent rate over the last few, five years. In fact, um, they've uh, escalated approximately $225,000 uh, since 2015. So that's a 71% increase in our um, WC, uh, WCB premiums. Much of this increase is due to external factors and, and all organizations are are uh, incurring such an increase, um, mainly because of presumptive language that's been uh, put into the, workman's, uh, the, the Workers' Compensation Act, um, and, and also because of some, some actual um, incidents uh, within the district, both in the police department and the fire department. Um, so this project would, the objective of this project would be to uh, contract for disability management services and with the aim to reduce um, the occupational to increase the occupational health and safety of our staff and improve our return to work uh, programs, thereby reducing our premiums. Uh, there are potential savings outlined by WCB if, if we're able to achieve a discount 
that far exceed the cost of this project that would um, be perpetual savings in, in the um, in the financial plan. So we're proposing it as a, a pilot with the hopes of creating sustainable uh, uh, premium reductions in our overall budget. Another um, new project on this list is the asset retirement obligations. And this asset retirement obligation project comes from new accounting standards that are being introduced in 2022. And this standard requires the district to identify and, quanti and quantify our end of life environmental liabilities so uh, for our assets. So for instance, uh, when the building uh, gets demolished and a new building is built, the district has some environmental liability obligations around the handling of the asbestos in, in the building. And there could be other environmental liabilities with our other assets that we need to identify. So the um, public sector accounting standards is requiring uh, municipalities and other public organizations to quantify and identify uh, that liability in our financial statement. It'll take a bit of work uh, with the engineers and the accountants to figure that out. Um, staff would like to do this in-house and in-kind if possible. It's being placed there uh, in case there are capacity constraints uh, for, for staff so some work could be contracted out. Mr. Payne, can you just explain briefly if anybody's watching, because these are largely funded out of uh, surpluses. Uh, so when you say that, you know, it, we'll use the money if we don't, it's not tax money for the most part. These are typically used if we need them and not used if they're not. Can you just uh, clarify how these items are funded? Yes, Your Worship, and thank you for that prompt. Uh, it's an introduction I, I meant to give at the beginning of, of this presentation because all of these projects you will see are uh, large and they are infrequent. And so uh, they're not really appropriately funded by taxation because then we would see a large increase in our taxes to the tune of $1.3 million for this year. So what they're funded with is previous budget savings from our operating department that have been set aside in our accumulated uh, surplus reserve. And so they will not, um, in, in, they don't impact taxes directly. And if, if, the fun, if the project doesn't occur, the, the funds simply remain in our accumulated surplus reserve. Thank you. Well, thank you. And in terms of the sustainability of that, the, that, that fund is a finite amount. So if council uh, drew down on that fund uh, year after year, it would, it would go to nothing. Um, however, you know, when you look at the average spend of, of these special projects proposed over the five years, it's, it's around $500,000. And that's pretty well close to what it just turns out our historical surpluses are. Uh, so in, in, that, in that lens, it, it, it is a sustainable amount. If the amounts were much larger, then I might not, uh, I might not say that. Uh, the next project on here uh, to consider is the emergency evacuation plan. Uh, last year, the district was the recipient of a grant to update our emergency evacuation plan, and we did that. Uh, the next phase was to uh, integrate our plan with the, uh, the, the core area uh, regional uh, municipalities. We applied for a grant to do that, which uh, was declined simply because we've been so successful of, with the grants in the past. Uh, so, but staff are still uh, proposing that some work continue. Um, the scope has changed a little bit. So the price has gone down to $10,000 and that would be funded by surplus as opposed to a grant. So it is a new funding source, which is why it's being noted today. The next two reviews here are being proposed by the finance department, the utility building process review and the parking services review. Uh, the scope of, the, of this work would, would be to uh, review how do we utilize our current software, uh, software and, and um, uh, provide recommendations to leverage it to provide maximum efficiency and enhance customer service. We want, would want to review the hardware that, the, that we're using to provide uh, those services. And we would, uh, and so the deliverables would be um, uh, policy recommendations and, and bylaw updates. Again, this is the type of work that um, a, uh, a finance nerd really would like to do. So it, it is something I, I would like to do if possible or the deputy director of finance. Uh, but uh, the projects have been placed here again in case there's any capacity constraints rather than deferring the work and perpetuating uh, not ideal uh, practices. Uh, we, we'd like to uh, just get the funding up front there. Uh, so that actually concludes the, my comments. Uh, you'll notice there are, there are a, no, a number of other projects, but as mentioned, a lot of them have been uh, discussed in detail recently. 
or were previously approved in the financial plan, which is why I didn't go into further detail. Uh, the leadership team is here if uh, council has any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Payne. Um, are there any questions? Uh, oh, there is uh, from Councillor Appleton. The system works. I'll just remind people if you're if you're hitting the buttons, it's it's easy to make a a mistake under reactions. There is a a hand waving which only shows up for a couple of seconds, and then the, there's a little bar at the bottom that says raise hand. If you click the bar, your hand stays up until you're done. So. Uh, I think we've had a couple of people who have waved at me and then disappeared again. So if you're, uh, if you just choose the, the raise hand, that's a little, little more sticky. I have Councillor Appleton, then Patterson, then Zalka. Uh, thank you, Worship, and uh, through you to staff. Um, Mr. Payne, just with regards to uh, the final items that are down here, there's, there's a couple of items that relate to community climate action work group recommendations. And in the strategic uh, session that we just held, there was uh, some uh, direction and interest in having additional recommendation, additional recommendation, the cost implications of that included. So I'm going to um, assume that that's still coming in an upcoming uh, iteration once that uh, number has been arrived upon. Mr. Payne. Uh, yes, Your Worship. So uh, the additional costing has not been integrated into this draft financial plan. And so it, it would be if, if, um, if and when Staff bring that forward for council consideration and, and uh, direction results from that. Um, in terms of the timing, um, I'm, I'm afraid I, uh, it's uh, it slipped my mind when the timing would be. Um, however, the director of building and planning here may be able to provide more insight on the timing. Sure, is uh, Mr. Anderson, are you able to address the timing question? Uh, yes, uh, your worship. Uh, it would be also brought forward at the same time we're bringing the uh, the, the cost information regarding the uh, um, infill housing and village area plans. So we'll be bringing that forward in early March. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, uh, Councillor Appleton? Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Patterson? Yes, thank you, Mayor. And uh, through you to staff, um, if uh, I'd, I'd like to have a little more clarification on the occupational disability claims management program that is on here. Uh, a, is, is this intended as a program um, that is a, a one-time program um, or um, is it continuous? How does this fit into the, the other funding that we are, are working on for occupational um, health and safety overall? Um, cause it, there's, because it, the funding in here is, is, is really only a couple of uh, models and it, there's no continuous funding throughout the years. Just trying to understand if this will become operationalized um, once the program is in place. Sure, thank you, Councillor Patterson. Mr. Payne? Uh, yes, Your Worship. And as uh, Councillor Patterson uh, correctly uh, pointed out, uh, there, there is um, additional funding in the, in the human resource budget for a uh, position, the uh, Occupational Health and Safety Officer uh, position, which is really a, a position um, uh, d designed for proactive work in, in the area of health and safety. This, this um, project that's being uh, proposed here is truly a pilot project. And what we're hoping is that there are some promising results that come from that. If, if, the, uh, if the results of the pilot are uh, reduced WCB um, premiums and, and also reduced injuries in, in our workforce, uh, then those, uh, those reduced costs could fund an, an ongoing um, function for exactly that. Um, so we're hoping that it would provide additional options to consider uh, at that time if it's a, if it's a success. So uh, if I could continue, Mayor? Go ahead. So um, there will then, I, I take it, be some uh, report coming back to Council after um, the program uh, is is underway and the, the, some results are, are determined. Uh, your Worship, I yeah, had, go ahead, uh, Mr. Pardon me? Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Payne. Oh, thank you. Yes, Your Worship. Uh, what I had envisioned was uh, um, not a formal report, but certainly that discussion coming back to council, uh, most likely in the form of a financial plan. And uh, I, I have um, experience in this exactly where we have outlined uh, premium savings from similar projects at a different municipality, and that's where the discussion took place. Um, however, of course, if council wants additional information or a, 
or a formal report on, on that, that's something that uh, staff would absolutely be willing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Uh, I have Councillor Zalka next, and then Councillor uh, A. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I very much appreciate uh, this absolutely wonderful um, uh, draft financial plan. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, to read and has answered most of my questions. So uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, a question um, through you to staff. Um, uh, this plan provides, I understand, the maximum authorized spending that can occur uh, as part of a financial plan. Um, uh, a general question uh, uh, that I'll provide with a specific example. If uh, one of these uh, special initiatives um, uh, goes over budget or ends up being a larger scope than is anticipated, I'm, I just wanted to ask uh, uh, in general, what would the mechanism be for, um, for increasing the maximum authorized spending? For example, uh, one of them being uh, emergency evacuation plan. Um, since that was put onto the plan, we now have, uh, for example, Richardson uh, uh, Road will most likely be closed to Oak Bay traffic. Um, and as uh, an evacuation route that has now quite, will, will change char the characteristics of that plan quite dramatically. Uh, I just wanna give uh, uh, the, the uh, financial, uh, director of financial uh, services could please uh, comment. Sure, and comment on the, uh, on the, how we deal with changes to the cost, not to the Richardson roadway, if you, <laughs> to, to clarify, uh, because that's outside of Mr. Payne's purview. Uh, Mr. Payne, what is the process should one of these projects uh, end up going over budget? Yes, Your Worship, uh, ideally and, and more often than not, uh, in fact, it, it should be rare for staff to bring a project back after the fact. If it's gone over budget, that's uh, it's not good practice, it's not accountable. Um, you'll, you'll recall last year, Council was in receipt of uh, quarterly reports with full year financial projections, so quarter two, quarter three. All projects are, are reviewed at that time and forecasted at that time. And if at that time uh, staff believe that uh, it's going to go over budget, alternative funding sources are, are recommended. Now, in the case of special projects, um, uh, generally, you know, we have $1.3 million budgeted for this year. It's highly unlikely that that actually all gets spent. So if a, if a budget, um, if a particular project is going to go over budget, I, I, uh, my communication to council is we have, we have enough in our uh, bylaw um, to continue. So there's no amendment to the bylaw needed. Uh, council just needs to, to know and, and be in favor of that budget go, going over budget. Thank you. Uh, anything else, Councillor Zolka? Thank you, Councillor Ney. Thank you, um, Three Mayor, uh, Mr. Payne. Uh, um, yeah, I like this chart. This is really helpful. Um, I was just wondering if you might, um, I, I'm looking at the parking services uh, review, uh, which in the text speaks to um, a review of parking enforcement services. And uh, you've got a little description here. I'm just wondering, it makes sense to me. I'm just wondering if you could help us understand what prompted that review. Sure, thank you, Councillor Ney. Mr. Payne? Yes, uh, through you to Councillor Ney, a, a good question because um, as we, as we uh, moved into the pandemic, um, staff paused and asked, what, what's our right approach to parking enforcement here? We, we recognized that parking patterns had changed as a result of the pandemic and folks were home. And what we did was we transitioned to a more uh, educational compliance model, which, which explains why our parking fine revenues are down in the previous year. So that's a question that we wanna ask council. What is your expectation for parking enforcement in the community? Do we want uh, to to um, rely more heavily on fines to influence behavior or or more of an educational approach, and councillors should have a say in how that looks. Um, it's basically a service level question, um, and so th that would be in scope of that project. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ney. Uh, Councillor Braithwaite. There you are. Sorry, um, I couldn't get to my, my mouse fast enough there. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I just had a question in, and I'm not sure if it was answered when Councillor um, Patterson asked around this, but it's around the um, Occupational Disability Claims Management. And in reading the text, um, I noticed that the, uh, there was something in there talking about 
um, the total premier ex premium expenditures and how much it had risen um, since 2015, which is about 71%. And I just wanted to um, ask why that was, and, and it's probably not it's probably without not within our purview to to uh to change that but then in the next paragraph it does talk about um a discount surcharge and um that we are ex we were paying a, a a discount surcharge or a experience we we're paying an experience rating as a 36 percent surcharge and then it talks about how we could actually reduce that. So I was just wondering if you could touch on that. Sorry to be so vague on that. <laughs> sure, go ahead, Mr. Payne. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I really actually appreciate the prompt because I was working with the Chief of Police and the Chief of uh, the Fire Department today uh, to, um, to describe uh, some of the underlying reasons why the premiums have gone up. And uh, the Chief of Police uh, uh, provided the following text, which, which we thought encapsulated it quite well. So the presumptive clause, that's the clause in, in, in uh, the workman, the Workers' Compensation Act that, that presumes an illness if, if one um, has, uh, presumes that the cause was the, the employment in certain cases where it can't be causally shown. So the presumptive clause had an immediate and lasting impact as well as greater societal awareness of mental health issues and trauma. So there's, there's um, some presumptive clause in the Workman's um, Compensation Act around uh, mental health and trauma. And we've also had a member physically injured on duty in the police department, including one uh, who's currently off who was seriously assaulted and required surgery. So there's an, there's an event in particular that could also lead to premium rise and uh, a, a number of other um, factors. So, so if I if I might just ask one more question there. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. So on page uh, 19, where this is, where the description of this is, it does talk about there's a maximum potential savings on premiums is estimated to be $337,000. So I was a bit confused with that. Sure, Mr. Payne. Uh, yes, your, your worship. So WorkSafe BC uh, levies your premiums based on essentially your history and your staff oh, okay. history of using that benefit and, and of incidents that require them using that, that benefit. So if, if the district uh, were uh, claim free uh, for a long period of time, that's the maximum that we could save in, in annual savings. And this program uh, supports that. It also supports uh, an earlier return to work, uh, which, is, which is taken into consideration uh, when the premiums are calculated. Thank you so much. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Payne. Uh, any, uh, Councillor Nay, you still have your hand up. I'm not, is that intended or? Nope, not intended. Okay, we'll just uh, uh, move back then. Um, I just have two very quick questions then myself, Mr. Payne. One is uh, the deer management is shown in green as new. I'm just curious why that is, because it's obviously it's a continuing program. And the other question I had was the sea level rise. My understanding is that is um, leaning that is uh, geared largely towards uh, the McNeil Bay um, mitigation of erosion. Is that correct? Is that what I'm reading? Uh, your Worship, to answer your first question, um, yes, we've been uh, we've been providing deer management. We, we've had that year after year for many years. Um, however, wasn't was it in the financial plan last year? So it's it's new in in respect of that, and it was kind of contingent on. Uh, the, the, the provincial grant being approved, which we've received confirmation that's been approved. So that's why it, it's showing as new. Council will, that, that grant program will come to an end. So council will have to decide at some point, probably this year, um, wh what's the service level for deer management moving forward and how to fund that um, on an ongoing basis. Uh, I'm, I'm going to defer your next question, if you don't mind, to the director of building and planning uh, um, in terms of the scope of the sea level rise project. Sure. Uh, Mr. Anderson, are you there? Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the sea level rise uh, was funding that was set aside to allow for any implementation measures that came out of the study that was conducted by the Capital Regional District. Um, so intended, though, for uh, my understanding is more for any policy or communications work that we needed to do with respect to implementing any of the study results. I don't believe that money has been uh, targeted for physical improvements 
in response to sea level rise. Okay, thank you very much for that clarification. Uh, I don't see any other hands to so give the last chance. And at this point, I'm gonna invite the public to ask questions if, any, if they have any on this area. Um, Ms. Williams, if you could put up the, uh, the phone number on the screen, then people can call in. And if you're on, um, if they, I see a couple of uh, people on the Zoom call as, as if they wish to uh, make themselves known and speak directly within Zoom, are they able to do that? Or do they have to call into the phone number, Ms. Williams? Uh, Your Worship, anybody who's participating in the meeting can raise their hand if they've come in through a web browser using that uh, command on the toolbar. Okay. If they've come in using a telephone, uh, then they need to hit star nine to raise their hand. Perfect. Thank you very much for that clarification. So people listening know. Um, I don't have the ability to see hands raised just because the uh, the phone number, of course, takes up the screen. Are you able to see hands raised if they come from, from members who are not council? Uh, yes, Your Worship. I'm able to scroll through the participants. Great. Thank you very much for that. So I'll leave this up for a minute here as we uh, um, to give people a chance to call in if they wish to participate. And again, uh, you're more than welcome if you if you want to call in and, and wait uh, anyway, this is a good chance to, uh, to jot the number down or, or, or call in and just sit and hold while we, uh, we deal with issues as they come. I will certainly call on the public throughout this if there's any, uh, if anybody wishes to speak, I'll try and make it as, as easy as possible. Uh, noting it is already 8.25, so we're gonna try and get it done here by nine o'clock tonight. Uh, so not too, too many more uh, opportunities. Ms. Williams, has anybody called in or raised their hand at this point? Ms. Williams, you're muted at the moment. Uh, has anybody called in? Ms. Williams, I'm going to ask uh, you, your 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 audio is showing as muted at the moment. Ms. Williams, are you uh, able to hear? Has anybody called in? My apologies, Your Worship. When I expanded the participant screen, I lost my toolbar. Oh, no uh, problem. I was desperately trying to come back. <laughs> uh, there are no hands up and nobody has called in. Okay, thank you. We'll just uh, move on to the next uh, item on the agenda. Unless there's any other last questions that people have come forward, uh, have thought of. Oh yeah, Councillor Braithwaite, go ahead. Thanks so much. Um, I just had a quick question uh, just to, just for my information, um, based on the um, suggested 6.9% tax increase, um, just to Mr. Payne, I'm assuming that's about $265,000 for 1%. Is that correct? Mr. Payne? Uh, yes, Your Worship. The proposed proposal is 6.5% tax increase, but to answer your question, yes, $265,000 is 1%. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. That helps put our, our decisions in a bit of context there as well. So half a percentage up or down would be $130,000 approximately. Great. Uh, any other questions? I'm not seeing any. So I will move on. We can move on to the um, past uh, special initiatives to 6.4, the corporate administration. Yes. Mr. Payne. Yes. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm going to share the screen again for the folks uh, watching at home. We're on page 41 of the financial plan. Great, thank you. And I'll just briefly um, outline some of the, uh, the accomplishments and talk a bit about some of the variances in the operating budget, pause, and then carry on to the next operating budget. Uh, so in this uh, operating budget, there's a proposal of 2.5% uh, uh, FTE. So a bulk of the uh, pre-approved staffing funding is going to uh, this department. Um, much of it, the occupational health and safety officer that the leadership team had prioritized. Can I just check the screen you're sharing? You're sharing your email. Oh, my apologies. I'm sharing my email. Oops. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this Sorry, <Williams>? I was... <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing. That could, have uh... been, that could have been far more embarrassing than it was, Director Payne. So I yeah. think it's you're um, fine. Yes, indeed. Oh. Uh, yes, Councillor Green, do you have uh, a question? Yes, I'm sorry. I just saw that the Zoom meeting was at risk for security reasons. That came up on the screen. I just wondered, is, is that an issue for us or not? Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, that, that's been resolved. There, there's a, uh, a troubleshooting 
um, application for when we post the details to the meeting publicly. Oh, and it okay. alerted it alerted us and, and uh, it's been resolved. Thank you very much. Those no, th th thank you, Director Payne. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, back to the actual uh, financial plan here. Uh, here's the Occupational Health and Safety uh, Officer proposed in the financial plan as described. These, these changes here to the clerical staff is essentially net 1.5 uh, in clerical, 0.5 for HR and, and strategic initiatives, and the other uh, clerical to support um, uh, corporate administration. I'll just touch briefly on some of the accomplishments from last year. The Marina, Marina lease negotiation is well underway thanks to last year. Todd House grant application was put in. Um, the Corporate Administration Department applied for the Canadian Award for Financial Reporting, which is still being considered, and also applied for the UBCM Excellent Award in Governance, which it was a finalist for. Um, the uh, department implemented quarterly reporting and integrated that with financial planning and led the EOC uh, activation as well as completed council procedure blah, blah. Uh, Some of the things planned for 2021 include the completion of the Marina lease um, uh, lease negotiation, uh, the Council Chamber Audiovisual Project, Enhanced Civil uh, Civic Web Portal, the expanded use of media management software for operational efficiency, and uh, continued corporate record classification and retention program. Those are just some of the snippets I took from the long list of accomplishments and planned uh, work uh, by this uh, department uh, shortly. So to, just to speak about some of the variances you see here, variances, uh, th this Operating budget doesn't include the extraordinary increases down here. Extraordinary just means non-status quo increases. And these are the uh, staff increases that uh, I introduced earlier. So some of the variances here, most, most are modest and, and just represent salary increases. Um, uh, and although council, the council line item has been increased by 2%, that's just, it, it, that's just a contingency for possible remuneration increase. However, council, I just want to be clear, council has not directed any remuneration increase to, for council remuneration, um, but there is a contingency there in, in case. Um, for the corporate, for the human resource budget, our, our GVLRA uh, 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 dues uh, rose significantly this year due to one, one member dropping out of the GVLRA. So the fixed costs still remain in, in that uh, association. Um, although one of the, the members is no longer cost sharing. And our risk management budget has climbed uh, entirely, but this is entirely almost due to our insurance premiums rising by $25,000. Uh, for property insurance and liability insurance, we pay almost over $200,000 um, in total. And this, this increase was not unexpected. We sort of saw it coming in, in last year's budget and we did integrate it into the 2021 uh, column of the 2020 financial plan. Uh, so this is almost entirely uh, insurance costs there. Uh, so that, that will summarize the corporate administration uh, budget. And I'll pause here for any questions. Sure, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Payne. Are there questions of council? And again, I'm going to ask, uh, we're, we're really sticking on page 42 or 44, sorry, of the, of the of the plan now, if, uh, if people are following along on their, on their financial plan report. Um, go ahead, uh, Councillor Braithwaite and Councillor Patterson. Thanks so much, Mayor. Um, yeah, I have a quick question in regards to on page 42, um, sorry, 40, is it 42? Just one second. 41, actually, um, under the staffing history and forecast, forecasted requests. I noticed that it has, for the Secretary 3, it has three FTEs. And then on page 44, it actually only shows two um, Secretary 3s. And I'm wondering if there's a reason for the discrepancy there. Yeah, uh, go ahead, uh, Mr. Payne. Uh, yes, thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, so the the increase of three FTEs, which is the true increase, is funded partly by new funding, which comes from the new staffing envelope funding, and partially by the elimination of other positions in the department. So, for instance, the confidential administrative support clerk, one of those right. positions have been eliminated, and and ha and the part time funding has been eliminated. 
So the graph that you're referring to on page 44 is just yeah. the new funding provided. I see. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Councilor Prithvi. Councilor Patterson. Yes, thank you, Mayor, and through you to to staff. Um, just um, uh, a query, suggestion, I guess, um, and, and not one that can maybe be readily answered. But because the financial plan looks to the future, and it's the annual report that looks to the past, um, what I would like to also um, understand through all the departments, and so certainly perhaps that could be commented on as people go along, but the, the challenges perhaps that might be faced um, by each of the departments um, at, for the coming year, because um, you know, we've, looked at, we've looked at the accomplishments um, first, but that will be reported again and probably in more detail in the annual report. But what I'm really looking to understand is to, to the overall financial plan, what are the challenges in each depart, department that they, they may want to, to, to talk about um, that we might not hear about um, as part of the operational piece of this? Thank you. Uh, sorry, just for my clarification, Councillor Patterson, you're just suggesting that that might those those challenges and opportunities could be included within this document, so that yeah, we... yeah, I, I, you know, I would, I, I think that that would be meaningful information to be part of this document, and so certainly if um, other department managers are included in any of this and they they have any thoughts on that, I would encourage that they perhaps um, uh, speak on those things when it comes to their department. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Patterson. Uh, I have uh, Councillor uh, Appleton next. Uh, thank you, Worship, and, and through you to staff. I noticed that um, one of the performance measures associated with, uh, with this section is responding to FOI requests. And I know that we've, um, we've had this raised uh, by the CAO uh, a number of times over this past year. And I'm just one, wondering whether or not uh, Mr. Payne or, or others could comment on sort of what the uh, human resources uh, implication of responding to those FOIs is. I notice there's sort of a 50% increase between 2019 and 2020. So is, is some of this new staffing that's required, is that sort of ad, uh, associated with uh, this component? Uh, sure, thank you, Councillor Appleton. And I'll, I'll let either uh, Mr. Payne or Ms. Williams may be uh, able to answer that, but I'll give it to Mr. Payne first. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. And I do recall last year, uh, the district actually had to contract with, uh, uh, with, with a, a previous corporate administrator to get some of the FOI work done. Um, however, this discussion, uh, uh, me and, and Ms. Williams actually had this discussion today, and I, so I know she has a good answer for you. So I'm going to defer the rest of the question to Ms. Williams. <laughs> uh oh, uh, you've been you've been put on a pedestal now, Ms. Williams. Uh, the answer. Yeah, th for... thank you, Your Worship. I'm trying to recall that conversation. Um, <laughs> Uh, largely, uh, the way that the, the corporate services department has been restructured, yes, so short answer is yes, it will allow us uh, more capacity to manage those FOIs. I, I'm not able to give you the metrics right off the top of my head what the hours spent are, but certainly the numbers of requests are going up, they're not going down. Another component to this, of course, is the records management program that's in progress. And a, a part of our challenge right now as a, as a corporation is our ability to, to efficiently put our hands on those records. Um, so we do anticipate over time that we will be more efficient in how we process them. And through our records management uh, uh, project, and of course our new website redesigned out in 2022, we're hoping to, to push more information out there, which should decrease the, the need for requests. I hope that answers your question. I think yeah. it does. Yeah, okay, that's, nods. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, if I if I might, your worship, just go ahead. A question. Yeah. Just with reference to the um, to the insurance item um, and recognizing it's been a significant increase to insurance costs. And I mean, I'm I'm not sure the extent to which Mr. Payne or others can really comment on this, but I think we're well aware that just insurance as a general concept is is becoming you know increasingly expensive, and you've seen it you know become. Uh, 
uh, seen the impact of that notably over the last couple of years. So I'm, I'm just wondering to what extent we can we can make any kind of projection on that, or what what can we expect in upcoming years? Um, and that's a very difficult one to answer. But I'm just very conscious this is something that seems to just be spiraling upwards in a pretty uh, on a pretty quick clip. Sure, Mr. Payne. I uh, guess your worship. It it appeared that insurance costs, you know, for a period of time. Um, we're relatively flat, relatively predictable. And when I spoke about this to our insurance brokers, they, they said the, the insurance industry goes through these periods where um, there's a lot of competition for premiums, premiums re remain low, and it, it gets to a breaking point where the underwriters can no longer compete if they keep those premiums low. We're going through that period right now. And all the underwriters, uh, the major ones in the, in the world are really reassessing uh, their business model and, and increasing prices. In, in terms of a crystal ball, how long it will go on for, um, our, our discussions are th it's just at some point that it restabilizes and that becomes the new norm for another long period. Uh, and, and, then, uh, and then there will be another dramatic rise. So I can't say for how long. I, I, in terms of what's in the financial plan, next year's insurance in, in the financial plan doesn't have a significant cost escalation um, uh, attached to it. So I, I'm not in receipt of information suggesting that we'll see another dramatic rise next year. That's, that could still happen, but uh, until, I, until I have better information, I haven't integrated a, a, a large increase for next year. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions. I, um, I just, I think the, the point of FOI, we just had a report at the CRD on on their FOI costs and the and the and the great great increase of, of requests they're getting there as well. Um, I just want to acknowledge both the work done for training, uh, you know, in terms of records management for each one of us as council, but also all of the staff members, um, because obviously if you have twelve copies of an email floating around that are still in people's inboxes versus one, uh, someone has to go and and decollate all that, et cetera. So. Um, that work done to kind of help us in our, in our records management individually has been really, I think, really important. Um, but also just, I think we get a lot of FOI requests sometimes when people don't feel they have transparent information. And I just want to, again, acknowledge the work done by staff and this council to to really work to make sure that we're as transparent as possible, everything from getting our our uh, agendas out earlier and our minutes up earlier and the the quality of the financial planning and reporting documents, the quarterly reporting, the work planning, all these pieces that allow people to have a bit more clarity of what's going on. I know it's boring reporting type stuff, but you can't argue that you don't know when a motion was made or what's the, what's the status of it or where it's at anymore um, or where staff are at with projects. So it, it'll, it needs, we're going to keep improving that, but I think that's the kind of work that we can do as a council as well to help reduce those FOI requests because if we're more transparent and clear, uh, then people have a, an ability to go and seek that information themselves and, and frankly, just trust uh, the quality of work that's going on. So that was my, my two cents on that as well, because I think we have, all have a, a role to play in that. Um, I don't see a lot of other questions on this section. I'm happy to go... Um, what I'll ask if, if anybody that's online hit star nine to raise their hands, or uh, if you're on the call, on the Zoom, if you wish to raise your hand to ask questions, you can do so at this time. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll make that call as we go through these different sections. So again, star nine on the phone or raise your hand within the Zoom application if you have any questions. Ms. Williams, is there anybody who has uh, raised their hand on the phone lines? Uh, not in your worship, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I will then uh, move on to the next item in the agenda. Oh, oh, oh! Sorry, Councillor Green. Oh, thank you very much. I, I, I just wanted to add that this this particular area, administrative um, services. I, I don't think the public realizes how much change has gone on in that department, and particularly corporate services. I think it's really important um, to clarify for the public what what tremendous change has occurred since since 2018, I, I am really overwhelmed by the, um, the changes that are being made there constantly and, and the leadership shown from that department. So I just wanted to add that. Uh, again, I know that people don't see this, it's not a tangible thing to the community at large, but I think for us, it makes a huge difference in how we operate. So thank you. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Green. It's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent point. And I, I'm glad that staff raised the point of just such simple things as, as you know, core to our operations of asset of uh, um, records management. When, when every staff member has to take two hours to find a record instead of, you know, 20 minutes, that cumulatively across the organization adds huge amounts of overhead. And, and these are the things that we can address through, through these kind of improvements. So they're really fundamental to our operations in the long run as well. So um, moving on then to uh, corporate, uh, sorry, to uh, administration and residential facilities. 6.5, Mr. Payne. Yes, thank you, Your Worship, and I'll share the correct screen here. <laughs> there we go. Yes, yeah, so page 45 of the financial plan for those that are following from home. Uh, so this, the, the, um, the, fin the financials of this department were previously recorded at, in the corporate administration operating budget. So you recall, you may recall from last year, there was a municipal hall line item in, in the operating department. It's been reported separately to recognize that the district is really shoring up a facilities function. You notice we'll have a, a facilities a capital plan that's been separated as well. Um, and it's just to recognize that that function is really being un under the lens by the leadership team. Um, it doesn't include facilities for the police department, fire department, parks, rec and culture or public works. So really what we're talking about here is a municipal hall some of the residential property and, and the um, residential properties that we own. Okay. And, and previously the amounts um, received in lease revenue were net amounts. So the, essentially the amounts reported in the financial plan were the lease revenues less the related expenses. That net amount is what was reported in the financial plan. We've grossed those up, those amounts up for greater transparency in this financial plan so that the public can see the full amount of lease revenue that we receive from the various properties and the expense side of the equation. And we've also included there in there the transfers to reserves for those facilities. Uh, so council and the public can see the, the whole picture there. Great, thank you very much. If we can go back to the, uh, the talking heads page, I will just uh, unshare your page. Oh, sure. If anybody's there, uh, it's page 45 on the, uh, in, the, in the report. Um, uh, there, are there any questions on these on these aspects? I uh, go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Uh, thank you, Worship, and just through you to staff. I'm just wondering, uh, given you know our earlier discussion about the library, with the recognition that the library building sort of is physically contained or at least physically adjacent to the Monterey Center. Uh, and so I'm assuming is, is not included here because it's included in the parks, uh, rec and culture ca uh, uh, buildings budget, building maintenance budget. I'm just wondering just from a, I guess, uh, nature of the building uh, side of things and, and for, uh, for us to be able to see that as a, as a sort of separate municipal facility, would it make sense for the library uh, to sit in this section now that now that this has been created, which I think is a, a great way to present the information, makes uh, it much more clear. Uh, would it make sense for the library uh, maintenance to sit in this category, Mr. Payne? Uh, thank you, Your Worship, through to Councillor Appleton. Uh, yes, I think it would make sense. And what you're really seeing right now is the. Uh, the first steps of developing that facilities function, but that facilities function should be all encompassing, right? So that facilities function should uh, participate in facilities planning with parks, rec and culture and with public works and police and fire so that a holistic approach can be taken to all of our facilities. So I think you'll see um, that function being all encompassing in, in future iterations. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on this? I'm going to just skip to the next one before I open up the phone lines again, uh, just as we can finish up our finance and information technology um, before we get on and, and try and wrap up this meeting. Um, so go ahead, uh, Mr. Payne, this should be near and dear to your heart. Your Worship, with your permission, I'd actually like to present the police department budget only because the chief has been here the whole night. Oh, sure. And I will be around next week, so I can <laughs> defer my part if you're agreeable. I am, I am very agreeable to, to switching that up. If, uh, so we'll, let's, let's do that and then we'll, we'll, we'll deal with the next one next week. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. 
And should I just introduce the Chief Bernodis then, or, or what's the what's the appropriate process here? Uh, Your Worship, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, run through the uh, presentation real quick. There won't be any um, surprises as, as the, the budget appears exactly as the same as was presented in November. And then Chief Bernodis is available uh, if there's any uh, questions from, from Council. Uh, so just, uh, sorry, just fixing up my paperwork here. Okay, so what we have here, um, uh, some, of, some of the accomplishments from uh, 2020, including uh, the promotion of, of, of four uh, uh, new uh, members and uh, uh, the, the department's first female sergeant and first female uh, reserve sergeant. As well, the department purchased its first electric vehicle, which is the administrative vehicle, and is planning to purchase a, a new electric vehicle in 2021 as well. That's part of the fleet. That's part of the actual marked fleet that RFP is underway uh, as we speak. The department also uh, renewed and updated a service agreement with uh, Sandage PD and created a new agreement with the RCMP for the dog service. In 2021, the department is planning to create uh, a training room and, um, and also create a trauma-informed interview room as part of that, uh, that renovation. Some of the variances here, um, almost the entire uh, variances is in the protective services division. Uh, council should keep in mind that none of these uh, increases include um, anticipated increases for collective bargaining, which has been um, uh, addressed separately in the budget. Uh, but the protective services uh, agreement increases due to a number of factors, one being escalating WCB costs and other, uh, other um, uh, benefits, as well as uh, $36,000 for the new uh, dog unit, as well as an increase of $25,000 for the ecom uh, uh, budget as well. And those are what are mainly driving uh, the variance here, all forced growth factors. And so they've been integrated there. Again, uh, nothing in the department um, is, uh, is different than what was uh, presented in November. And so uh, the chief is here to answer any questions that you might have. And your worship, um, also, um, before we finish tonight, if we have time, we, we could uh, review the police capital budget. I could do that right now if council prefers. It's a very uh, simple budget. Sure, do that as well, and then we'll get to questions. Okay, let's, let's scroll down here to the capital budget. Okay. You know what, I should have just... So I'll just I'll point out the uh, the operational budget is at page fifty one and the uh, police services capital is on page eighty seven. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Yes, your worship and so fifty one and eighty seven. Yes, thank you, your worship. And so the capital budget for twenty twenty one is quite simple. Again, we've got um, the police vehicle that's being replaced as we speak. Uh, some computer equipment as. Uh, 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 required by the, their IT providers at uh, Saanich and some police building report, repairs, all, all normal items in the financial plan and a very consistent financial plan over the next five years. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. I have Councilor Braithwaite with a question. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, Chief, uh, through, through you, Mayor, to the Chief. Um, on page 51, Chief, I noticed two things. Number one, um, that um, you're purchasing your first electric marked vehicle. Yay, that's awesome. I'm looking forward to seeing that. And number two, um, that you're decreasing the size of your department by uh, two members. And is, I, I'm assuming that's another two members as to the ones that you've already decreased, or is that the two members that have already been decreased? Uh, go ahead, Chief. So um, thank you. Yes, we're excited about the new uh, EV and the RFP has gone out and we're actually shortlisting them now. So we hope that uh, we'll acquire one um, within, uh, you know, weeks to maybe uh, two months. And once we do and it's outfitted with police gear and marked up, I'll be sure to uh, invite all of you to our little uh, ribbon cutting uh, or whatever we'll do for that. Um, with respect to um, the decrease of two members, uh, those are the same two members that I spoke to in the provisional uh, okay. budget a couple months ago. So it's just two members down. Yes, thank you. Okay, and, and perhaps if I, if I could be allowed one more question or one more comment. Um, on page 50, I was looking at the, um, 
the performance measures and uh, obviously um, some of the performance measures have been um, affected by COVID. Uh, but um, I did notice that um, bylaw infractions looks like they went up. And uh, again, that might be something to do with COVID, but um, I'm wondering if you can speak to that. I, I, and I guess the tickets and warnings issued went down dramatically, but again, I, I'm assuming that that's because of COVID. And even in your 2021 forecast, it's not going up to the same level as it was in 2019. Yeah, so with, with uh, one interesting sort of observation through COVID anecdotal is that uh, while we did try to use more of an educational approach on some issues around parking, um, we did find more things being related because people were at home. Uh, so we were learning about when people were calling us a lot more about uh, maybe cars speeding by their house um, than they were aware of because normally they're at work. Um, the positive side is that there were less uh, break and enters to residences than we would normally see in a year because um, most of us have been at home. So uh, there's there's been some small positive to COVID, I guess we could say, but that's likely going to cover off the bylaw question. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to the department for the great work that you guys do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. Uh, any other questions uh, to the chief? So, uh, yeah, it's not not expecting a large number, just given the the detailed presentation that happened in November. So, uh, thank you very much, Chief Arnotis, and thanks for uh, sticking around this evening for your chance to to thank speak and, and to Mr. Payne for suggesting you go you go forward here. So, yes, thank okay, you, Chris. Yeah. Okay, uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Have a good night. And uh, back to you, Mr. Payne. I think uh, we're really. Uh, don't really want to go past nine o'clock. So uh, is there anything you wish to wrap up here on the um, on pieces before I go to question, uh, just general questions and to the public? And again, maybe we can put the, the, the phone numbers up for um, uh, for the public to see in case anybody wishes to call in before the end of the meeting. Um, and again, if you could just raise your hand electronically, then then Ms. Williams can see you, even if I cannot. Uh, so with that, um, but Mr. Payne, anything else you wish to to summarize? Uh, no, not at this time. Uh, um, it, it's uh, I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation uh, next week, uh, February 11th. And uh, what we'll do um, on that day is um, uh, continue through the operating uh, budgets. Uh, we'll have. Uh, finance and IT, fire department, engineering and public works. Um, and hopefully, and I believe that will actually go quite quickly. So uh, if council is agreeable, I think we should start the capital budget discussions on that day as well. Great, thank you very much. Are there any questions from council before, uh, before I go to the public? I can't see any hands. Ms. Williams, are there any uh, council hands up? Uh, no, your worship, there are no hands up and no members of the public at this time. Okay. And again, anybody on the phone, you need to star nine to raise your hand or in here, you'd have to just raise your hand through the Zoom app. But I'll assume people know that since it's on the screen and, and uh, we've said it a few times. Uh, and we have another opportunity next week to have the same conversation. So uh, we really do welcome the public to come and, and watch and ask questions um, as we go through this process. And again, uh, I guess then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll just move to adjournment. But before I do, I just want to, uh, I guess I'm just going to mimic what Pretty much, I think every councillor has said, and, and the and the public has said that they've called in just to express my appreciation for the for the format of this uh, financial plan. Uh, I think it is uh, it is written in a way that people without financial training can read it. Uh, and if people have questions about any line item, there's there's nice, fulsome descriptions in plain language that help outline. Uh, it's a, it's no small task. I know how much how hard staff have worked to get it to this point, uh, and what a difference in the last uh, two or three years to get here. So I uh, just want to express uh, what everybody else has already said, which is that it's uh, it's a great document and 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 very simple to follow in that sense. So thank you for that. Um, is there any other uh, questions or anything before we go? I'm not seeing any, so I'll just need a motion to adjourn. Move adjournment. Moved and seconded. Thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. That passes. We are adjourned. We will see you on Monday for our regular <laughs> council meeting. So uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. All right. Thanks.